Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filstered make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholster.com. Primary Arms Government recently showed off a new giveaway, which features a new Daniel Defense M4 V7 rifle, complete with GLX 1 to 6 power first focal plane rifle scope, PLX mount, and more. These monthly giveaways are only open to first responders and members of the military, so there's way less competition for the big prize. Entry is also completely free with no purchase necessary ever. So if you want to have a chance to win, just visit primaryarms.com government and hit the giveaway button at the top. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have relied on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. Hey everyone, Matt Lanfer here with Primary and Secondary. Welcome to Modcast. Today's episode, today being April 19th, 2023, someone actually brought that up in comments a couple of years ago saying, can you please say what the date is? Looking at the old episodes that are seven years old, it kind of makes sense to add that. Um, the episode number is 338. We're going to be talking about subcaliber revolvers, specifically 22 revolvers today. Okay, there's no reaction from the panel. Come on, guys. Uh, DM, we're going to be talking about DMR3. So we had one episode with Alex and Ash and Mark, and the episode wound up going a little longer than what our audio hosting could handle, so I wound up breaking it up into two parts. Well, the guys here and a couple others listened and said, hey, there's some more points we can bring up and we can discuss. I thought, Cool. We can delve into this even further. Uh, my background doesn't have that much DMR experience in it. Um, as a cop for the past 20-something years, it's, it's an understood concept, but it's, I, don't under, I don't know the nuts and bolts. And so it's cool to have these kinds of discussions where I can listen as a layman and come up with dumb questions because I'm dumb and because of my inexperience. And hopefully some of these questions can help people also understand, but Ian actually put together a really good template for the direction we're going to go. Um, before we started, I, I did mention, and Ian said it as well, uh, there's a good possibility we may wind up leaving this template on occasion for a free flow discussion. It happens. Those are really good. They're natural. Um, don't be scared by them. It's okay. So again, yeah, my background's in law enforcement. been doing the cop thing since last century. Started primary and secondary back in 2014. We've been doing the podcast since 2016. Um, we started off with very unstructured discussions where we went for hours, where we would have literal dead time for hours on the episodes. And those early episodes, I would break up into bite-sized pieces. They'd be 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, 
and they were fun little snippets to to uh, to share. I got some feedback basically saying people were looking for the uh, the long form content, and that's where like we kind of changed up the the format. And these dis- discussions like this really really thrive. They're really beneficial because you get to hear the entire discussion and understand where we go to different points in this discussion, as opposed to all of a sudden, Oh, we're talking about caliber. Oh, we're talking about scope. We can see the natural progression with these, with this long form uh, discussion. So love these. These are great. I especially like the ones like this, where I don't know as much as I possibly should or could. So it's going to be a good educational experience for me. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to have, these guys start talking and they're probably going to plug things. One of the things I like to say, and I try to say at the beginning of the episode, I definitely say at the end, make sure you're supporting those sources to be, or make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. What I mean by that is if you like what these guys have to say, Alex, for example, Alex teaches precision rifle. If you like what he has to say, pay attention when he's saying who he represents, pay attention to the companies he brings up give them likes, give them shares. When these guys are sharing something that's beneficial to you, if it changes your opinion, perspective, outlook, give it some credit and credit doesn't have to be monetary credit can be a like, it can be a share. Uh, the, the algorithms on every platform do not work in favor of anything gun industry or training or military law enforcement, any of that kind of stuff. So that's where you, the listener comes in and you can help all these individual companies pages and people with your likes, your shares, and your subscriptions. So when these guys are given their backgrounds, pay attention to who they are, what they represent, and listen to what they say. And if you like what, what, what that is, give it a like. Same with everything primary and secondary. Uh, we've been on now for a couple minutes. Make sure that you hit the like button on the, uh, on the YouTubes. Wouldn't hurt also if you're listening on the audio to do that if possible. So I'm going to stop talking. Speaking of Alex, I'm just going to start with Alex because it's fresh in my mind. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, back again for another one. Uh, yeah. My name's Alex Hartman. I uh, started off in the Marine Corps, uh, moved over to the Army, um, and then departed after about 15 years. My time in both the Marine Corps and the Army was spent as a uh, scout sniper. Um, and now I am the founder and CEO of Ridgeline Defense. Uh, where we operate a uh, couple hundred acre training facility up in Northern New Hampshire and try to spend the winter months uh, snowboarding to the best of our ability around the country, trying to stay warm on other ranges. Um, We're probably most known for our uh, precision rifle and um, DM stuff. uh, Although we do have uh, a a pretty wide cadre. There's seven full-time instructors that range from uh, recently retired Sephardic staff NCYCs through uh, Sniper Schoolhouse NCYCs and everything in between. Um, so we're, uh, again, pretty heavy on the mill side, pretty heavy in the LE side, and then we, we like to fill in the weekends with uh, open enrollment classes. So the people who up here in New England who otherwise wouldn't have access to cool ranges can come hang out on a cool range and, and uh, work some steel. So Cool. So speaking of which, working where you're working, training up, up there, are there any restrictions people need to be aware of if they're bringing a rifle over in that direction? Nope. So I like to say we're like the Tennessee, the North. Um, so New Hampshire, it's live free or die. And they take that serious. Um, even flying in and out of Boston, it's uh, it's a non-issue. So state law is you can, you can transport whatever you need to from A to B as you're working through there. Um, so if you're coming through flight or coming through uh, or driving through any of the banned States, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, I mean, I fly on suppressed machine guns like belt feds through through Boston International Airport. So it's they're they don't know what they're looking at. So they just kind of like, yep, fill out the tag and let you go. Good deal. Ian. Wait, I got lost in different windows here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Follow my voice. Yeah. But that's not how this works. Uh I'll try to keep it quick. I'm not as uh as well. My experiences are not that of those of many others here, but I uh, started out in the Marine Corps for eight years, long brick in service, ended up in the Army National Guard uh, in 2006. And um, while there, I've got, uh, I, I became the uh, program manager for the state's designated marksman program. 
uh, at Camp Roberts. It's it was one of the pre-mobilization training assistant uh, elements. So a lot of reserve and National Guard units would flow through it, uh, and uh, we put that program on the SDM program as one of the um, packages that units can can get. So uh, between my time there, uh, I was also deployed a number of times to Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, training those ganglings up. Uh, right now, um, I work for Blue Force Gear. I do uh, demos. I do uh, product engagements with vendors. I go to law enforcement departments and things like that. So if uh, anyone out there needs support, reach out to the good folks back at Blue Force Gear. And um, depending on the region, I may or may not show up. But uh, that's basically, oh, work for the, uh, I'm the assistant state marksmanship coordinator for the state of California as well. So i uh, had my finger in this pot for a little over a decade. That's all I got. And we discussed doing a Blue Force Gear episode, right? No. Okay. We need to do a Blue Force Gear episode. Okay. One of the old episodes I just listened to was like episode number 30. Stephen was on and it was just cool. And so I thought, oh, we need to get, we need to get that back All together. those folks are just wonderful people. Yeah. They're, they're fantastic folks. Yeah. And they make kind of good, okay stuff. It's okay. Yeah. Mike. Uh, Mike Lewis, retired Army, um, been out about eight years. Nobody cares who you used to be. So now Cambridge Consulting Services, um, focusing on training and education, primarily looking at leader development and trainer development because leaders, by definition, should be trainers within their organizations. Uh, also dabble in job aids, training aids, this and that and the other. Happy to be here. No one to plug? Yeah, myself. Can't break consulting services. I thought there were I, I thought there was another company that was going to come up too. Oh, <clears throat> uh, there will be. Okay. Mike zero. sucks at promotion. Yeah. Go on Amazon.com by his zero tools. There you go. Terrell? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh Terrell Peterson. Uh, former Army guy, spent 20 years in the Army and the infantry, uh, most of the time carrying a sniper rifle. Uh, I, used, I ran the sniper school for a little bit before I retired. I retired a long time ago. Pushing 14 years out now. Uh, since I retired, I've been a contractor and working for different organizations, Department of State, uh, writing curriculum and uh, teaching that same curriculum overseas to different uh, different countries. So right now, I think my country count, I'm up to like 25 different countries that I've taught DDM to uh, around the world. And now I'm just, uh, I'm a contractor for a government agency and it's a uh, good living. Thanks. Cool. John? Good evening. Uh, John Hawes. I retired out of the Army last year. Uh, it was 21 years, mix of active duty and reserve time. Uh, most of that time, I uh, was a rifle instructor or sniper in some sort of capacity, graduated five sniper schools, uh, created a couple localized SDM programs, went through the AMU's SDM program back in 2008, uh, served as a contract rifle instructor for a few companies across the country, and then went to gunsmithing school and got picked up on the Army Reserve shooting team. Did that for five years as a gunsmith and a firing member. And now I, st I still work for Uncle Sam now as a uh, federal employee, and as a firearms expert. I inspect firearms for stuff like import, export, um, you know, unique cases like that. Interesting. So uh, still work for Uncle Sam, so I got nothing to plug. So could you divulge what the most interesting thing that you've had to work with with import, export? I deal with a lot of one of stuff, and uh, recently I'd say probably a 120 year old eight eight bore double rifle that came through. Oh, cool! So, out of what country? Know. Africa? Yeah, uh, it was it was or bought in England and coming into the U.S. Cool. Chad.
You're you're muted. Here we go. There you are. Good now. All right, cool. So boomer. All right. Hi, we're doing the intros. I see intros. All right, cool. I am now me, but fatter and older. Um, my color, my beard. Um, what color? Back to where it was. <laughs> Four kids. About a month ago, actually. You know, I was cool with kids calling me Santa, running up and hugging me and headbutting my Glock, Glock, my Glock, and getting funny looks. Um, and then the final straw was leaving daycare with the girls and a young mom and her dad, their granddad was helping her with the kids into daycare. And uh, he looks over at me, he's like, pop Paul off, man. And I was like, Oh God, kill me. So. You know, my wife says the same thing about me. She's like, people think that you're the two year old's grandpa. (laughs) Oh, they don't. Yeah, they do. Okay. Totes. But yeah, before kids, I was um, training a lot. Um, I'm going in reverse order. The last training I was really doing, I was on a foreign training team. Um, it was a corporate uh, type deal and doing new equipment training overseas for a big foreign customer. And we were doing that as a five-year project that got clipped by COVID. Uh, we were also doing domestic training, all types of classes. Uh, prior to that, by a few years, I was at State Department and uh, pertaining to this um, discussion, I was in the DDM DM cell there, started out as one of the DEAV gunsmiths. And um, actually, Jake Wees came along and he's like, hey, dude, uh, we need your input for uh, gas guns. And so whenever I, that was already rolling and spec'd out the Mark 12s, the peculiar Mark 12 for State. Um, that was really he and I, that was us. And, um, we spec that out and then contracts change happened and I just followed the contract, basically stayed with the same company and went to FTU and stayed with the DDMs and doing high threat stuff, machine guns and all that fun stuff. And, um, why would a, just a gunsmith be there while well, I was an actual squad designating marksman in the Marine Corps 20 some odd years ago. Our unit was the first ones to get the ACOG mess. And they're like, you're the senior guy as a almost corporal. Here's your manuals, your XMFs, figure it out. And so went straight out into the world with that. Um, And so that really, those experiences really are what drove me, uh, uh, my frame of reference there Mm -hmm. as to my approach to DMs within law enforcement, within military, what is the DM actually supposed to do and what their role is and what do they really need out of their system? And so, yeah. Is there anything else I need to cover right now? Anything to plug? Because we're at the end. Because we're over now. This hole under my notes. Um, Just doing some podcasting, YouTube type stuff right now. I've got this really cool studio I've built in my spare time. Um, Now that I'm no longer, I'll say no longer, I've been doing it all week. I was full time with twins. And now that they're back in daycare, I have a little more time. I'm looking at options out there to see what else I might do. I started this with the the hopes, not really hopes, but just thinking, hey, I got to keep one toe in and start maintaining some name recognition. (laughs) Um, Not that that's really worked, but yeah, so I've been doing my own channel called The Chad Show. And uh, yeah, trying not to show my ass too bad. I know what you need to say also. If there was a screen name people would know you by, what would it be? Oh, Boar Brush, yeah. That goes way back. Yeah. Yeah. Back when we had to put quarters in our computers to get them to work. That's right. <laughs> nice. So, in the words of Mr. Chad Mercer, words mean mm-hmm. things. Yes. And the first thing that we have listed here is let's define some of these concepts. So when you guys are talking, the listener can go, oh, I know what they're talking about, as opposed to trying to fill in the blanks with what they think it might mean. So, Ian, would you mind heading that up? Sure. And uh, Mike has a great 
way of going about explaining these things. But, you know, no one's communicating unless we understand what the other person is talking about. So, and even sometimes if wrong words are used, like muscle memory, it's not a real thing, but we know what you mean. So, you know, depending on the words, it speeds conversation, uh, it's efficient, you know exactly what the other person's talking about. So when we talk about accuracy or precision, do people actually understand these terms as uh, it will be used at some point in this modcast? Uh, people need to understand what we're really getting at. Um, so um, accuracy merely means, are you hitting what, you're, what you want to hit? Is the center, your mean point of impact, where you want it to go without regard to the group size, for example. Precision, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It's a very tight, consistent end state that may or may not be exactly where you want it. So high precision, low accuracy. What you want is both, for example. And um, I saw some conversations on the webs about uh, certain aspects of the last couple episodes, and there was some confusion. There were some miscommunication. And when that happens, people just kind of go down false false, um, false roads. So those are a couple. Um, DMR, DM is uh, law enforcement, but it, it came out of the military uh, arena. A anyone else, please, please jump in, please, on, as, as I go through these topics. Um, it simply means the DM is, is your designated hitter. Granted, everyone in the squad, everyone in the unit should be able to be the designated hitter. But unfortunately, in large organizations, you don't have the opportunity to bring everyone up to the same level. So you've got to you've got to select folks to make them the hitters that you want, that you wish you had across the force, but you just organizationally you, you can't get to. So that kind of drove the need for it. And it's not a new concept. Uh, it's uh, been around a while. I'll let uh, others get into that. I know Mike uh, has uh, deep knowledge of uh, the background there. Um, Will might mention overmatch, for example, and that's simply being able to do the other guy stuff before he can do stuff to you. Whether you detect, you identify, you engage, uh, you you can do stuff to them before you're vulnerable to their actions. It is the most broad way I have to explain it. Uh, we might talk about qualification. We might talk about certification. In the army context, anyway. Qualification is what you do with your baseline individual weapon or, or your assigned weapon. Uh, now, if you do some extra stuff that doesn't apply to everyone else, an extra capability, for example, that you need to validate, like using an IR pointer, like using a thermal sight, things of that sort, those are called certifications. So they apply to secondary weapons, they apply to the enablers that you might have attached to your weapon, the little doodads. <clears throat> Uh, perhaps even a an employment capability uh, using just your baseline weapon, like urban uh, engagements, like extended range engagements. Those are your certifications. So it, it layers on top of your baseline qualification. Um, enabler, that might come up, and it's just something that you attach to the gun typically, not always, that helps extend your organic ability, your, your eyeball, uh, your ability to um, see in the dark, for example, the things that enable your core competency uh, in a technological fashion. So those are the big ones there that I wanted to make sure people understood because based on threads I saw from the prior ones, I think people were talking past each other. Um, yes. Mike, you want to take over there? Yeah. Um, and that's a great segue, actually. Uh, after the last one, I heard from a friend and he was like, man, that was a great episode. But Alex and Scott and Ash were going down the rabbit hole of military weapons and not looking or not necessarily addressing the fact that DMR is, it's in the, the general vernacular now. Well, yes, it is. But as Chad has said so many times and the rest of us do as well, words mean things. DMR is designated marksman rifle, just like Ian said. If you are in a collective environment, meaning you're a member of a team, like a PSD, mm -hmm. um, squad, platoon, you're in a collective environment. <clears throat> you may have DMs. DMR, SPR is a thing, which was developed for the same role. 
And then with the DM, Chad and Terrell both mentioned DDM. I, I think they could speak much better to that. Uh, law enforcement, I, I don't know that law enforcement does or does not have DMs. I think it's typically a law enforcement sniper, but it's kind of the same role, but different names, same type role within that organization. Um, <clears throat> my key here is if we're talking DMR or SPR, those are defined things built and outfitted for defined roles with doctrinal backing. If you are not in a collective environment, you don't have a DMR. You, I, I hate this over specification, DMR, SPR, CQBR, Recce Rifle, blah, blah, blah. Here's my acronym, Jaffer. You've got just a fucking rifle. Shoot it. If you're a singleton, you've got a Jaffer. If you're in one of these defined roles, you've got a DMR or an SPR. Cool. And then we see the DMR matches. Oh, great. Everybody wants to attach a term to something. What is it? It's a precision or a semi-precision gas gun match. Go shoot your Jaffer. Have fun. Do things. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chad, Terrell, Alex, or John. See what they got. So <clears throat> I'll jump in here real quick. You know, one of the things that I think I even mentioned in the last episode too, it's like, you know, we love to like, assign terms like you're saying and, and and quite honestly the way i look at stuff is at some point while you know i grew up in the marine corps like ian and chad right so the words have meanings thing is something that gets pounded in pretty good through your leadership schools but <clears throat> you know there's also like scrabble rules right like words in common usage and so like when somebody says dmr we all generally know what you're talking about now if you want to go back and be like well was it a dmr was it a dmr from 1994 to 2001 was it a dmr from 2001 to 2000 whatever like that's if you want to go down, like if you want to be clone correct, which I'm not that guy. Like, I mean, the stuff that I was carrying and putting together and slapping together, much to my gunner chagrin was, you know, uh, I would, you know, blow cloners minds. Right. But <clears throat> the reality is when we say it, we all kind of generally know what we're talking about. Right. So I don't feel like we need to, to deep dive that the part that I will say, and yes, what you are correct. And the fact that, Hey, the a d true designated marksman from the military side is a member of a squad with advanced training and usually an upgraded weapon system in some way, shape or form on the law enforcement side, the term designated marksman came around because law enforcement sniper was not as warm and fuzzy as designated marksman. Right. So somebody changed the word, happy to glad probably got a, you know, accommodation out of it uh, and then moved on right <clears throat> now in law enforcement i spend a lot of my time with law enforcement these days you're seeing a changeover from or not i won't say a changeover but an increased or added capability of running out either you know small frame gas or um to either supplement or replace a good chunk of law enforcement sniper work and or carrying over into patrol to to uh, put a bridge between a SWAT response and a patrol response, right? And so again, none of it's wrong in any way, shape or form. And I think I said on the last one too, like if you want to be clone correct, we can deep dive clone correct, you know, doctrinally correct setups from for the next four hours. But <clears throat> the reality is and what it means today in the industry or community that we are a part is it is a semi-automatic rifle usually ar palette like ar pattern but could be different right with a level of magnification above and beyond what somebody to your left and right would be the other part that i think that we need to start to understand when and we're not even into training yet but by and large and this is where a lot of designated marksman training to include the army and marine corps goes wrong is it's taught as sniper light it's like a one to two week sniper school and the reality is, if you are not a one-man wrecking crew, if you are not an individual operator or essentially a singleton as part of a team, and you're unable to run a gun or observe or, or spot yourself or whatever completely alone while still keeping up with the maneuver of your team or squad, you are largely ineffective. And so like, there's a lot to unpack there. So I will uh, check off station for a second. That was great. Um, they're muted. As I was saying, you're really handsome. Um, I'll let y'all guess which one I'm talking to. Uh, 
he's 100% right. Now, as far as the DM, DDM, I believe that probably started with us at state. And pro- I think if I remember correctly, it was a little before I got there and there was a slight change to um, just DM. It was DDMs only. And they were very, very risk averse. And as far as images and um, the militaristic aspects and terminology, which is ridiculous because we got like bear cats with like mod deuces and all this other stuff going on at the same time. But don't call them snipers. So they went with designated defensive marksman. That's in the sniper role, unless that's changed. Cheryl could probably correct me on that one. And then we just dumped it down to just defensive marksmen. And they rolled within the PSD, be it advance, MSD team, whatnot. It started out with an MSD that they were the inherent uh, details guy with the rifle that has the capability to fulfill that protection role within the team. But with the accessories, equipment specifically selected that he is part of the team. He can feed from the same ammunition source. He can do all the jobs that they all do, but also he can take up long cover if need be. And he can take out uh, select targets and targets of opportunity as needed and provide better positive ID of threats uh, discerning between shooter shootable or not shootable. Um, We did a lot of couching and language there. And I probably just flubbed it up because of all that couching of language and stuff. But that's where we see it gets so, so jumbled up. Um, I don't really have much to add beyond what Alex was saying. Um, a big part of the going on there at FTU was sniper mafia, not snipers. And uh, it was always, it was always a paradigm of, oh, we, remember, you're not snipers. Got it. Why are we shooting the FBI sniper call? Shut up. You're not a sniper. You don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but we're not snipers. Why are we shooting this stupid qual? You know, it's, it, it's like, you don't want it. You can't have it, but we got it, but you're not it. So a whole lot of hierarchy pecking order going on there for a long time. Hopefully that's changed. Um, but that's all I got for now. Uh, Terrell, you got anything I've screwed up you want to fix? Nah, you're, you're all over it, man. Uh, the only thing I was, I was teaching uh, DDM on the other side, uh, for non-U.S. forces that were aligned to U.S., uh, making sure that you know our diplomatic protection coming from host nation would, would be able to engage targets at longer distances. As in most places, they have AKs, and trying to shoot somebody with an AK at 500 is problematic with iron sights. So we would uh, give them training on a. Uh, are my AR-10, and they've gone to, I think, general defense now. I don't know who they're, what they're shooting now. It's, uh, I, have, I have some questions about some of their, their choices. But anyhow, uh, it was also easier to teach because we didn't have to give any, any de- deployment, uh, how we're going to deploy it, other than here you deploy in a defensive role outside the, outside the venue, uh, you've done your advance, you come up, you put the guys in overwatch and they're in overwatch and sometimes you're overt, sometimes you're covert, but it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about being a sniper. It was about being a designated marksman to help defend. So I think that was the key for us. John, you got anything? Uh, I think they covered it pretty well. As Chad was saying, like the DDM, when I first left active duty, <clears throat> I seen the DDM advertised all the time. And it was funny because they wanted sniper qualifications, but you could tell by the job description, they're being very risk adverse. Like this is a defensive position only, you know, we're not offensively, you know, doing anything <clears throat> as a contractor, et cetera. So, yeah, I noticed that difference uh, back then, but, uh, you know, I'd, Coming back to like the SDM side, the squad designated marksman. I don't know if we defined that. I didn't hear anybody pipe up with that, but doctrinally, the squad designated marksman was a a member of a rifle team that had the additional skill set, hopefully additional equipment, but not always to cover you know the distance 
beyond the average infantryman, you know, from 300 meters to 600 meters. And so when we talk about the SDM, that was a member of a rifle team, regular infantry squad, but they were in charge of doing all the regular infantrymen stuff, but also could cover that three to six beyond what the average infantryman was trained to do. You know, the average infantry qualification ended at 300 meters. The SDM was expected to be able to pick up and ex extend that range. I just feel the need to hold this now. Put your helmet on. Dude, I would have killed for that, man. I was stuck with an A2 with an ACOG on the carry handle, man. I would kill for that stick. In my time frame, man, I'm just like, I'm talking flint locks on that period of my experience, that baseline. Um, and to what John was just talking about, the role within the rifle squad, extending your coverage. And um, the hard part for us at the time, and try not to divert too far off of that, but I want to speak to it right now. We didn't have the understanding because uh, our junior leadership, like the squad leaders on up, didn't care. They just thought it was oh, great for the, the gear guy. Here you go. Here, gear guy, have some gear. And they didn't even look at the manual. And so they didn't know how to employ it and they didn't give it a second thought. So now it's like, as, as the doer, now I got to advocate for myself. Like, Hey, instead of putting me down here on this floating dock, I should probably be somewhere up with a little elevation so I can actually employ this rifle. But you know, there's no advocate above because there's no, they hadn't established buy off. And that was the problem, the way the Marine Corps released it at first, because you have all the brainwashing of, well, if you got to have a scope, you can't shoot type crap back in the day. Um, but yeah, that integration in the, in the squad was really hard. Now, you know, as a team leader at the time doing it, it wasn't too hard because I was able to plug and chug where I went and we had a really good squad. So it was not a big deal, but yeah, I mean, you still got to be able to do that. So that it was, I guess it wasn't, it wasn't a job killer, but we never saw the real benefit of it. Like we could have, if we had gotten it earlier in the training cycle and if we had buy off from the command level from company down um, and, and had they been afforded the opportunity to include it. Cause we had a great workup. We, it, we just got it so late in the cycle and no, everybody's like, great, something else to deal with. We were burned out with trying out Molly and all this other crap they dumped on us at training cycle. So you're welcome world. We tried to kill it, but yeah. And this is why Chad has his own rant channel on YouTube. Now he does very well at it. Now, with that, let me pull it back just a minute and go back to the overmatch Ian was mentioning. Um, we've kind of beat around it a little bit, but overmatch, people heard through all the next-gen stuff, overmatch is because we're fighting PKMs. Look, man, when we talk overmatch, we're not talking a rifleman versus a PKM. We're talking apples to apples, oranges to oranges, not watermelon to bananas. Now, if you look at open... This is this is open, uh, no distribution restriction doctrine. The effective range of the M4 is published at 500 meters. The effective range of the AK is published at 500 meters. How many people are actually affected with it at 500? Yeah, but the published effective range is 500 meters. <clears throat> and when we're talking overmatch, we're talking being able to range them further than they can range you. 500 versus 500, you've got parity. You don't have overmatch. Now, when John started talking about the DM reaching from three to six, that aligns with the current Army doctrine. We want a 20% overmatch. What is 500 plus 20%? 600. So that gets us into that overmatch fight. I just wanted to throw that point out there. And, and if I can take that baton, you, you used a word just now that a lot of people misunderstand as well based on prior comments on episodes one and two. Doctrine. Mike, what's doctrine? Oh, I don't have one dash zero in front of me, or, but I'm going to give you the, the, the non-textbook textbook answer. Doctrine is terms, symbols, and best practices. Common language, terms, symbols, and best practices. 
Now, Ian, if I, I know you probably have it pulled up in front of you because you're a nerd. Go ahead and read the doctrinal answer for what I, is doctrine. I actually don't have it here. I've given this speech to my youngins, younger lads uh, enough times. Like you'll hear folks throw out the term TTP. I ask them, like, what's a TTP? What's a tactic? What's a technique? What's a procedure? What are the differences? You know, one of those things is prescriptive. It's not optional. The others, you know, they're, they're best practices. They're your guidelines that have been proven to work in the past. They're a guide. So the, the, the big 30,000 foot view of what doctrine is, it's, it, it comprises, like you said, it, it has principles. It's got symbols and terms and, and these TTPs as well. So when we drop things like a principle, that term, or tactic or procedure, they, they refer to specific things. And it's something that is that people will get their wires crossed uh, quite frequently. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole on this. I just want to give you enough for folks to understand what we're getting at. So doctrine overall is simply, like Mike said, it's, it's your best practices. Uh, it's authoritative, but requires judgment and application. So a lot of people seem to think it's a recipe book, but in fact, it's more akin to uh, a list of ingredients that you mix together on the fly based on whether you want jambalaya or a grilled cheese sandwich for the time, right? So um, principles are these enduring truths or fundamental uh, uh, beliefs that are enduring, right? As technology changes, as, as things develop, you might develop new techniques and tactics uh, based around them, but the principle that underlies your approach sort of remains the same, unless something drastic happens, in which case you go back and look at it. Doctrine is ever changing, right? And if, if you military folks out there don't like what's in the books, you don't get to complain about it until you give feedback to the proponent of the book, write it up and send it. They're required to look at all your comments. So you don't like it, help change it. Uh, and until then, you, you haven't punched your ticket to complain about what is or isn't in it. And, and it changes over time. Not everything in it is exactly right. So help the process. And an example of that is I'm thinking about machine guns right now. For a little while there, we had one, one, um, one thing that was dropped and it came back into the house. Mike, what was that? You're welcome. Swing yeah. and traverse. Swing and traverse, it disappeared. <laughs> Didn't make it bad. It just fell out of official doctrine, but it came back. So not everything that works is in it and not everything in it is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, that's what I wanted to get across there. Uh, the one thing that people on the civilian side misunderstand about what a procedure is in context of military. I know the word kind of creeps depending on your audience and, and the and the sector you're in, but a procedure is a non-optional way of doing things. It's the only thing in the in the army doctrine that is is thou shalt, like call for fire, medevac request. It is a a a known, good, speedy, efficient way to get it done. Everything else, best practices, uh, your tactics, your, your techniques, non-optional. They're your guidelines. They're your guardrail uh, to make sure that you, if you violate them, you, you can do that, right? But you just got to understand that if you're going out those pre-established best practices, you better understand that you, or you ought to understand that you need to justify, at least to yourself or to others, if it goes off the you know, if the wheels come off, why you did it and, and why it was approached. Just kind of know what those limits, those boundaries of, of past experience are. And why do we have the books? It's because um, otherwise everything's experiential learning. You have to reinvent the wheel every single time. So dig out those books, see what worked in the past. Don't reinvent the wheel. That's my spiel on it. Um, Terrell, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I was just looking. Uh, Army Doctrine as a fundamental principle was supporting tactics, techniques, and procedures, terms and symbols used to conduct operations and as a guide for actions of operating forces and elements of the institutional force that directly support operations in support of national objectives. And at the bottom it says, while grounded in enduring principles, doctrine is also flexible, adaptable, and changing. So you said all of that and then some, very good. Uh, but like we're talking about doctrine, I, when I was a doctoral proponent for Army sniping, we did change what 
how we did sniping. We did look at, and we rewrote the manual uh, while I was at the schoolhouse. We rewrote the manual to put in new things and to take out some stuff and to try to look at where we're going down the right path still. And that all changes based on, like I said, stuff coming in from the field, what we had done in Iraq, what I'd done in Iraq and what I'd done in Somalia. Uh, we looked at how was snipers being used now and what should the doctrine be? And that's why we came up with a course like uh, the CELT course, the Sniper Employment Leaders course. We came up with that to try to support uh, how we wanted to see snipers be used in the future. Of course, all that went away and uh, they have continued to evolve. I will say too that sometimes doctrine is is you know used in slang terms just as like it's just like the minimum standard of how we do things. It's just like, hey, this is how it gets done. So like when we were quoting, I think in the last one talking about a two two MOA standard or two a doctrinal two MOA standard for SPR DM gun. And a lot of people are like, oh well, my fucking Noveski shoots a half minute and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that's great. And most of the, well, every gun, I think operationally you're going to see it still in the field is going to shoot better than that doctrinal standard. But that standard is the line of the sand. If it does any worse than that, it's got to go get fixed. It's got to go get rebarreled. It's got to go see level, you know, level two, three maintenance, whatever. Um, and so I think people misunderstand of like what objective versus threshold are in terms of an accuracy uh, requirement and what that means in the field of hey, I can't do the job you're asking me to do based on the doctrine that you've provided and how I'm going to be employed because the tools you have given me are no longer meeting that requirement. And so I think that's that might be a little bit confusing because it's like, it's kind of slang, but it's, it, you know, basically it's go to the book. What's the book say? I've got to be able to do that. The second that any one of the things that I have to do that job break down, then I, I am no longer able to meet that doctrinal standard. Something needs to get fixed. And then not to jump too far around, but to jump back to overmatch real quick. I think one of the things that people are leaving on the table uh, uh, with overmatch or the concept of overmatch is also speed. All right. So like how fast is that kill clock? Cause right now we can sit there and talk like, you know, Hey, I give, you know, a mildly trained moron, a good bolt gun at enough time. They're going to, they can, they can hold, they can hem you up at the same distance you can. Right. Like, the difference is going to come down to speed. And when you bring that down, like when you take distance away, like, and you put like two dudes in the same room at seven yards, all the training in the world, the other guy could still get lucky. Right. And so it comes down to speed. And just because we get further out and like Ian started the conversation with the idea of accuracy and precision, we also have to have that idea and concept of speed and like an accurate shot right now is better than the perfect, most precise shot a little bit longer, especially when we talk about these distances where we're talking that 600 meter doctrinal line in the sand, because you're still within maybe not max effective, but definitely within max, right? Especially when we talk about, when we're talking about AK-74s, uh, I'm sorry, AK-47s, when we get to AK-74s, all of a sudden that whole paradigm shifts, right? So, you know, there's a lot to look at here. And I know like Mike was saying, we go apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Uh, but the reality is like they do that as a squad against us in the military as well. And so we're looking at different weapon systems from RPKs to PKMs to whatever. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind that there's there's a part of overmatch there that a lot of people aren't talking about. And I look at, you know, without making this too much of a, a doc of conversation, like I think a lot of the stuff on the NGSW I think right there, it's leaving too much speed on the table to be effective. It reminds me of uh, one of the seasons of Top Shot, where the two the two finalists they had to engage something at some extreme distance, and the three gun guy. How far was it, Matt? Oh, I don't remember. But you're talking about the fifty caliber shot, right? Yeah, there's the there's the proper schoolhouse guy. He's got the whiz wheel out. He's got the calculations. He's you know, putting the finger up for the wind, all this stuff. And then meanwhile, his competitor, uh, the three gun guy, he just fires a shot, uh, a sighting shot, and then quickly adjusts and engages the target. So that's the speed element we're talking about. I, I think that uh, you know, you're getting at and that, that most people would understand what, 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 uh, what we're getting at. That's all. You missed half of that TTP, Ian. Hold left edge and fucking send it. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, 
Yeah. So there's one aspect also, I, someone on the panel brought it up that you have to be in some form of an organization or a group to be that designated marksman. One of the things Alex just brought up with a standard for a weapon or even a person, there is no standard for a weapon or a person as the individual, as the person. Well, this is my DMR all by myself in my basement. What, how, okay, how is that a DMR? Well, I put a scope on it. Okay, how's the accuracy though? There's no standard. So people are chasing after an appearance of something, but not necessarily the performance. And even if they did have the performance based upon what, what standard, Ian? So, well, that's a lot to unpack pack there, actually. So mm, this kind of, yeah, the overmatch thing. So where do they go? So talk about the weapon, the baseline weapon. So I scrounged up these. I don't want to, can you, can you make that out? That's actually, I, I collected these up from, from the berm area downrange on a KD range. That's the little thing that ends up at 500 meters, 600 meters that you're trying to push your, your M16A4 or M4 out to. First of all, so, so the standard you're striving for, you need to consider what effects you want to have on the darn thing when it gets there. Can it get there through barriers, if that's a thing, or brush or, or foliage? Um, can the weapon perform the task you're asking it to? So taking an M4, like running SDM classes back in the day, some dudes would show up with an M4, and it's all they can do in the world to just maintain on an on a E-type silhouette. It's 19 inches, 20 inches across uh, for everyone else to keep all those rounds on that width of target. But if the designated marksman's role is to take low percentage shots at close as well as far distances, that's not going to cut it. So what do I need to do? So mission. So do if I need to be able to hit ahead, I, I'm not looking at a 500 meter target or, or capability. I'm looking with an M4 anyway. I'm looking at you know a couple hundred meters, 300 meters, 350 tops, and and it um, a, a lot of influences come into play when we're talking about what the standard should be. So. Uh, if, if you need to be able to engage one dude that's in some crowd, you know, in the head, because that's all you see anymore because he's in a, in, in a crowd, I'm making a scenario up right now, but your M4 may not do it outside of a certain distance. So, you know, the the distance matters, your, your ability to hit a small target matters, if that's what you're shooting for, literally. Uh, all these things come into play, and, and and you don't know what the enemy has. So how do you know that you have overmatch? Uh, you you, you kind of don't. Um, John Hawes, what do you got? I think you guys covered it pretty well, you know, hammering the terms out there. I haven't got nothing to add there. If I could jump onto like the, the civilian side of stuff, because we teach a lot of scope carbine classes a year. I mean, we're sold out from now to the end of the year. We probably put on the civilian side a couple hundred students per year through through specifically like the style of setup, whether it's, you know, the one to six, one to eight, you know, three to 12, three to 15, three to 18, four to 16, four to 20, blah, 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 blah. Right. In some sort of configuration. And I can tell you that the, the thing that people, you know, when they look at it, they fail to look at it as a system first and foremost. Right. So as an individual, you know, we're all talking about, Hey, define your mission. Well, I mean, your mission can be whatever it needs to be. Right. But the, um, the parts are like what I like to call the four components, of the accuracy equation, right? Or the weapon, optic, ammo, and then the shooter. Okay. And so we're all stuck here talking about guns and we, then we're going to start talking about optics. But the reality is how many civilians do you know that have, you know, an overwhelming lifetime supply of the same cartridge? Um, you know, and so if you start to change that out, you start to see different things, your different velocity, your different standard deviations, your most importantly, your different extreme spreads, given like the target size that you want to maintain to you. Right. And so you start to look at all those things, you know, and then you start to break down, okay, well, what, what, what hit percentage do I want? And here's another thing to think about. And this is important on both the military and law enforcement side, but, you know, also on the civilian side for what it is that we're talking about is like, Hey, if I'm, if I'm by myself, right. Or I am currently unknown or concealed to uh, my foe or opponent because of that distance to target. Well, if I take a shot that has a low percentage chance of connecting, I have now told everybody in the world, like I've unzipped my fly. Right. And so if i cannot deliver an accurate round, first round engagement or within immediate one second follow-up, like I'm talking a time of flight follow-up, you are, 
you are planning to fail because you're planning to do something that is going to open yourself up to a lot more uh, survivability issues than the lethality issues we're currently talking about. Um, so when it comes like, again, I don't think we need to tell anybody what their favorite color is, right? Like if you like a 12, five, or you like a 14, five, you like a 16 or an 18 or a 22 or a six arc or a two, two, four Valk or like whatever. Right. At the end of the day, the only thing comes down to is like what target to what distance under what conditions from what positions. And then what can you do up close? What's your ready up drill set? Like, can you maintain a sub one second presentation from low ready, high ready facers, turning movements? Can you engage moving targets? Can you utilize your night vision with it. Like you can go on and on and on and on at the end of the day, you know, I look at it differently for each person. Right. So, you know, law enforcement, I look at the DM, usually it's being able to be applied to, I'm sorry, with law enforcement, I look at like a uh, uh, accurized carbine or something like that, a scope carbine, SPR, whatever, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to look at the American sniper association survey to see what shots are being taken by and large and then what is your minimum and maximum because it's the outliers of any statistical analysis that'll bite you all right because why we always start to train towards where the middle is so your closer range shot like a jail cell in maryland or your longest range shot like almost 600 yards in i believe idaho right you are going to have you know, if you're going to say you have this capability or own this capability, then your weapon system must be able to do it. You must be able to do it with that weapon system and you must be able to do it at a high percentage of the time. Otherwise you don't possess that capability or your, your personal doctrine, if you will. Uh, let me bring, bring something back. Uh, we keep talking effective range. Again, words mean things. Effective range is not in any place I've been able to find in army doctrine is not defined. Marine Corps, I don't know. But my understanding through multiple conversations at the Puzzle Palace Fort Benning is that it, that is the maximum range that the average trained soldier is expected to have a 50% probability of hit with that weapon. That's it. So when we talk effective range, we're talking a 50% hit probability for the individual. We know that training matters, capability matters. Some people, their effective range with a 110 is going to be about 100 yards. Others are going to be able to reach with that scoped carbine six, seven, eight hundred yards. Effects on target is a different thing. That's terminal ballistics. And are you going to have the same effects on target at 600? Absolutely not. Velocity matters. Bullet construction matters along with the velocity. All kinds of things go into play there, but that's the effective range. Just, just want to hammer down what that means because it doesn't mean if you put a 5.56 five, round on someone at 600 meters, it's going to be effective on target. We don't know that. Uh, my 16 inch gun with, with my 77 grain match load I run, I go transonic at about 600 meters, a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have nearly the velocity it needs to have at that distance to have good terminal effects, but it'll ring steel. If it had to punch a hole, it would punch a hole, but it's not gonna have good terminal effects. Just wanted to hammer that down. And that's, that's something to consider, right? So you brought up a good point about, you know, where you go transonic and one of the things, so effective, obviously based on what is the terminal performance. So if you look at a lot of ballistic software, they're going to tell you kind of, are going to ask you for three things to be able to punch in. What's your vital size you want to hold, which is going to kind of determine your max point blank. What's your velocity threshold, you know, where you're going to go transonic. And then what's your um, energy threshold, depending. So you know where that bolt is going to maintain performance to terminally, depending on, and that's not usually for any sort of intermediate barriers. It's just playing it, you know, straight up, you know, energy on target. What does that mean to you? Now we all know that, you know, fragmentation threshold is roughly like 2,200 feet per second, high velocity rifle bullet. The 77 grain in particular has got the cannula to help and aid in fragmentation, you know, and then like, dude, alpha one, I mean, that stuff, one, it's spicy as hell. And then two, um, obviously has great, great effects. And we've seen really good action. I mean, we do, we were getting like 3,200 feet per second at a more 12s off of one. I mean, it just cooks, man. And, and so it does really well. The thing to think about, and, and again, or the thing to keep in mind, the army 
is no different from a corporation like your most generic, like blue box corporate world ever with the only difference being that the mailroom kills people. Okay. And so a lot of doctrine and a lot of stuff is going to be built on the fact that as like any large organization, they have to make rules for the many, despite, you know, usually for the actions of the few. Right. And so they're, they're going to look at like, Hey, we know we've got, we can't get really tight because if we get too tight, we don't get what we need or what we want. Right. And so you're going to look at that. Now, when it comes to figuring out what is effective, one of the easiest ways that we've been able to determine with a large degree of accuracy and it, and it's, it's fairly ammunition agnostic, but if you can stay within your supersonic range, okay. So like to the bleeding edge of transonic, like that is going to be your, like literally your hit probability almost falls off to a cliff at that point. Now there's plenty of, plenty of us have shot bullets well through transonic and into subsonic and depending on the bullet and its consistency going trans, we can do that. I'm not saying it's not impossible, but what I'm saying is where that hit probability starts to fall off is usually somewhere in line with that bleeding edge of transonic zone or somewhere between like 1340 and like maybe 1240, not all the way down to 11, 1120, but somewhere in there. Um, and then the other part that I would, I would bring up for that is, um, you know, when you, when you are looking at, at these levels of performance is what can you do? Like, what is that extreme spread? You know, a lot of people look at only at SDs and like, look at like the perfect number, but the extreme spread is really going to start to tell you like, Hey, where's your hit probability at? And the last part that I'll add for that on hit probability is like Mike brought up, you know, Hey, 50% is max effective. But if you look at any of the precision style or precision school houses and the qualifications that those graduates are required to, to maintain, most of them are 80% or above uh, and being able to, to increase that hit rate, which is why we're sending the expert shooter there to only get better. And with that, one more thing, uh, Ian and I nerded out on math a couple of years ago. We're talking threshold and objective and talking the individual capability. You, we can extend your maximum effective, and this is no shit, this is math, it's repeatable. Assuming the shooter can do a proper range estimation, has a good wind call, and can use the correct holds and or the correct dot. If the shooter is capable of a four MOA performance, four MOA, head nod, head shake, is that difficult for most people? It shouldn't be. But if the shooter can maintain a four MOA grouping all day, every day, no matter what, assuming they have a good range estimation, a good wind call, and they know their data to make their adjustment and aim, that four MOA grouping will give you a 50% hit probability on an E-type silhouette or a human being out to 825 meters. No shit. Well, yeah, I mean, there's something, if you want to get into it, we get into like WES analysis or weapon employment zone analysis and figure out where we can put enough rounds down range to figure it out. The, the average person isn't going to go do that test or have that ability, right? So they need to kind of draw their own line in the sand of, Hey, based on this velocity with this round, you know, where am I going to be able to maintain? What is my wind performance? How good am I at wind calling? You know, how accurate is my range finder? Like, do I understand how lerfs work, you know, uh, beam divergence and, you know, hitting near side versus far side or anything like that. So there's a million and one things, just like we talked about last podcast, a lot of it comes down to training and education. Right. But, you know, when people want to talk like on the civilian side or and, and to a a large part of the law enforcement side, because every department is its own kingdom. Like they can do whatever they want and nobody can really tell them to sit down and color. Right. As long as whoever the guy is there can come in and say like, Hey, I want this because of this, I can justify it. He can sell the bosses on it. Then you can get it. I mean, for better or for worse, because you know, you see some really good stuff and you see some really dumb shit. Right. So, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it really comes down to identifying your own mission, you know, and, and I hate to say that, but not your own mission, but your own use case, you know, is probably a better, a better word. Should we get into the historical context of the DMR? Yeah, let's do it. Do it, Mike. I'm just listening. 
Okay, so the DM, to my understanding, traces its lineage. We could go way, way, way back to where there was not a DM and a squad. There was a unit of DMs. And it was Morgan's Rifleman. Funny we're doing this on the 19th of April because that was during the American Revolution. Morgan's Rifleman had to be able to hit a shingle standing at a distance of about 200 yards. And with the muskets at the time, that was a task. And then we fast forward World War II, although it was not in the, the table of organization and equipment, you started seeing guys with M1Ds, or yeah, M1Ds and 1903 A4s. Standard battle rifle, but scoped. That's your squad sniper. And then the squad sniper, quote unquote, did appear on the table of organization and equipment around the Korean War era. And then fast forward, fast forward, it kind of fell off, it was reinvented, it fell off, it was reinvented. And then GWAT kicked off and oh my God, we don't have anybody to take these shots beyond 300 meters. Terrell's got a story about that with rifles being built and units fielding their own. And it, it started out hodgepodge. You would see M14s brought out of I think it was Aniston Army Depot and reworked. Uh, Alex mentioned Sniper Light. Yeah, I was a squad leader in Korea. <laughs> and we deployed from Korea to Ambar in 2004. And we were told, we're going to send one dude per platoon to sniper school. Snipers are coming over to teach sniper school. And these guys went for like a week and a half and came back and thought they were snipers but they didn't get a Bravo 4 ASI because they weren't snipers. They got handed M14s with scopes. And there were some dudes with M16 A4s. There, there were guys with accurized A2s and A4s. And the DM was really a hodgepodge thing, at least in the Army, for years and years. And then now we finally have a standardized, this is your rifle, this is your optic, this is your role. But if we look at designated marksmen, it goes all the way back to the revolution, even though it was not within the platoon. And for a time, uh, the verbiage, what train fire three, if not prior, they did call him the squad sniper, you know? So that, that, that idea as that we're trying to shake their snipers, uh, it kind of goes back. So I've got a little piece of bar trivia for you guys. So for our research, for our designated marksman program development course we do for law enforcement, we were we did some deep, deep diving. The furthest back we're able to find the actual term designated marksman is actually from the counterterrorism in the mid to late 70s and, uh, and into the early 80s. And it was the actual, it was the guy with the MP5 when everybody else had pistols doing linear assault. Uh, so that was, that's a little bit of bar trivia there. I don't know how true that is. It's just what we were able to find. You know, there's, there's not the best history on this, but we tried to be as educated as possible. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Cause when I first heard that, I was like, you said what now? Um, cause it's so, so foreign to what, what we know it as today. You know, I was looking at the, uh, sorry for whomever I interrupted. No, that's there. me. Really? Well, it doesn't matter then. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> so the, uh, I actually came across the term in the anti-armor book when it comes to AT4s and laws and, and whatnot. And he's your, he's your dude that is supposed to be spun up on being really good at that thing. So, you know, like the term special purpose or SPR, uh, well, it depends on what your purpose is, I guess, and, 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 and what you want to be the marksman of. So um, that's out there. Uh, Go ahead. No, and the, yeah, it, the Marine Corps had it um, actually in security forces through the Cold War years, um, 80s, 90s. And they actually, uh, out of where, Little Creek or whatever, they actually had a, a course for it out there. I don't know what it constituted. I remember for a while they're using some goofball looking M1, or it was probably an actual M14 that was tricked out um, somewhat, but they actually had it integrated with their recover capture whatever the flight suit guys um and so they were using them for initiated assaults uh recapture tactics team rtt that's what it was um 
but they had that role at least in the nineties. Um, yeah, so, honestly, fast, so fast and recon were both yeah, issues. fast too. It was an M14 uh in a McMillan chassis or McMillan stock yeah. McMillan stock at the time. Um, and that was quote the DMR. It was that was the the vernacular nomenclature for it. Um and then that it, it's funny if you look at the years of service, it's actually you know goes all the way through. They kind of just like took the M39 EBR program from Crane and kind of like carried it over, even though ours was like a crane ish because PWS really still had their hand in it. Because those original DMRs were also PWS built by the 2112. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, and that's I think that's where it might a lot of this, you know, confusion or verbiage of whatever gets in is because you know, we had these rifles in the Marine Corps DMRs, you know, that then led into widespread feeling of DMs who are then issued 556 five, SPRs. And so all of a sudden it all comes together. And really a lot of it comes down to and what was the budget in the late 90s? Like, were they just fielding all sorts of programs to everybody here, there, and everywhere? Like, no, they were taking whatever they could possibly get away with from mothball, fucking putting it together and getting it to work to do what they needed to do at the time. Um, you know, and then again, so I mean, when once the bush year of fucking dollar started raining from the sky, like, you know, then everybody could go and do whatever they wanted. And then you started seeing this, you know, wide varying degrees of uh of of setups or iterations or employment. Um you know, and that's something we were talking about offline, I think, in the, after the last one was, you know, we're looking at, you know, snipers going away now in the Marine Corps. And, you know, they're like, oh, we're going to replace them with scout platoons. It's, they're going to have their own MOS. I'm like, well, you could have just had a scout sniper MOS, but whatever. Um, so now you got to retrain all these dudes, but you still have nobody who's in charge of figuring out like and creating the employment of it doctrinally right at that level. And it's, it's not nearly like, the nice part of when I went to the army was that like any question I had, there was a book for it and like, you could go get it. You know, the Marine Corps, a lot of it's like, you know, pass, hand me down, hand me down, hand me down. Uh, be, and then actually there is a book, just nobody knows that it exists or where to find it. Um, so it's, it's kind of a unique thing there. It's propping a desk up somewhere. <laughs> I remember reading an X-File, so not the TV show. Uh, the Marine Corps uh, had these white papers, the, the, these booklets that went into these, uh, I guess, new ways of doing things. Uh, you can probably comment more on the point of X-Files there. Uh, but um, it described it as an M16A2 with, a, with an ACOG. And this is like in 2000 or something. Yeah, Warfighting Labs pushed it. Yeah. Yep. And the angry dragon on the cover. Dude, I still yeah. have. It. Yeah. And if you just read it, it is like, if you just inserted today's technology into that book and fought it the same way, you that would have an incredibly good program. Like yeah. me three years later. Right. So it's, it's really, really good. I mean, it's, it's actually super detailed. It's a shame that it was, I don't think it was ever limited distribution, but it, apparently nobody, read it i think well, it's they helpful. gave me all the books man you can like, Google this one and nobody wanted them I like, yeah no i think it's out there you can any old joe can find these things i think yeah i i took i took them over to the sniper platoon and uh to uh, jared johnson and a few of the other guys my buddies are over there i was like guys i just got screwed help me out and i showed them the major league like oh what is this stupid sh-? and then i started looking like oh this is this is actually this is actually pretty good Wow. And so we started, they talked me through it, gave me some kind of direction to go with it. I wish I knew where my copy ended up. I'll send you one. Hmm. Shukran. Can you drop files in this Zoom chat? I don't think so. We can share screens, but I don't think we can quite do that. Yeah, so if you look at the bottom of the chat there, next to the smiley face on the left, there's a little page turning thing there. It's going to give you the options of how you want to send it or whatever. You can the Google Drive or, yeah, just like what Alex is saying, that little page right there. Click on that page. OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive, Got SharePoint, it. Blah, 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 blah. Got it. If you're skilled. Yeah, so... PowerPoint, Excel, Word, Zoom, career progression. <laughs> hey, I love Zoom. Microsoft Teams keeps them from having to go in the office. Kidding me? Uh, the thing is marked F O U O. I'll uh, 
refrain from sticking it for, I'll refrain. Where are we, Matt? The interesting thing, uh, you were talking about the M1D. And when I was in the Washington National Guard way back 30 plus years ago, I actually had I actually carried an M1D and was the squad designated marksman. And it's an interesting sound when you hear pling. And you got that's cool. Yeah. No, it was fun. Where the squad was fun with the M1D. One rifle to shoot, uh, but the guard used to have. Well, when I was in the guard here in Washington, we had a marksmanship program that was awesome. Uh, they gave me an M1, an M1A, uh, M16 A2 accurized, uh, an Anschutz 1827BT, uh, biathlon training rifle, and all the ammo I could shoot in a safe to put it in at my house and a, a set of orders that I could go shoot uh, and do my guard training could be just going to shooting matches. That was a good time. Unfortunately, money runs out and all that went away for them. I think only a few states have marksmanship teams like that anymore. It's unfortunate, really. Um, for the Army dudes out there, <clears throat> Uh, you are allowed, you are with, with command approval, of course, but uh, the reg is out there to support individuals obtaining uh, service rifles and be compliant with AR-190-11, as well as 350-66, so that you can store that weapon at your local police department, a local armory to you, maybe your unit's not as close as another unit, uh, and uh, barring those options, well, anyway, dig into it. There, there are me uh, mechanisms in play for folks to continue to do that sort of thing. You can throw them in your POV. It's all authorized. You just got to know how to do it. So off the checklist, uh, we have left historical com uh, context and modern concept is where we're approaching. Terrell? You seem to have your finger fairly well on that this, the modern concept. I don't know if I'm if I'm my fingers truly on the modern concept, but I do think that with the the advent of the CSAS, the casting, I mean the combat uh, sniper system that we're now fielding with the HK gas gun with the SIG optic on top of it. Uh, that was designed for DMs in the squad before there was DMs in the squad. So basically that was, I call that almost the cart before the horse. Uh, we made the gun, uh, we have the ammo. We don't have a, a plan how to field it. So we'll, we'll give it to a bunch of people uh, and we'll do a, a, a course that's not really defined and teach them how to shoot it. And that's what we've been doing for the last like four years on that. So there's guns out there. They're all over the world uh, in the army. Uh, but there's no designated set course exactly or it's not in doctrine of what's that guy going to do in a squad? How is he going to maneuver? What's his true purpose? And it changes in some units, uh, the unit Sniper section in the unit says, thank you. We'll take those rifles and we'll give you something else. And you can keep the optic. We'll take the rifles. Because their M110s may be shot out or just worn out. And they'll take the rifle and throw the optic off the uh, 2010 on top of it. Sidebar question. Does anybody know how you can keep the 2010 optic if you got to turn in your 2010? Sidebar question. Yeah, <clears throat> half inch wrench. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll have to tell <laughs> that then. 
I'll tell him that exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, French, duh. Uh, I mean, when, when we turned in Mark 13s, <clears throat> um, that was, that was, I mean, all, you'd be surprised how much was not required to go back. So I, I'd take a really hard look at what they were actually asking for. Um, uh, well, to jump on like modern employment stuff for a second, again, this is all opinion based. Like there's like my opinions do not represent the United States Army or the United States Marine Corps, United States Coast Guard or, you know, the local Boy Scout troop. But, you know, and I think it'd be a curious idea for modern employment on the Army side of the house um, is to run it as the two team leaders are actually the DMs as well. And I'm like, before you, everybody freaks out, here's what I'm thinking. So one, they're going to have the reduced combat load. So fighter leader comp set means that they should be focused on fighting their guys. All right. So any shot they take needs to be, is, is going to be a little bit more, uh, or should be by more pre uh, precision. Um, they'll have a little bit better knowledge, the use of the equipment. But I also look at fighter leader concept specifically when maneuvering the A-dubs is if they have laser range fire capability on board with, you know, storm two or whatever, they can give a highly accurate range to target to their belt fed gunner right off the, right off the jump. And then, uh, and then walk them in, whether they're on tripod or not. So I just look at it for a couple of ways. Like I don't want to give, you know, snuffy who's like everybody else has 210 rounds and snuff over here has a hundred, right? Like that's, that's not the right answer to me. You're asking for the lowest guy to have the most discretion. I would give it to the guy who's who needs to fight part-time lead the rest of the time, but is going to have additional capabilities organic to him that would actually aid him in leading his team or bringing his assets to bear uh, in line with his squad leader's intent. So I don't know. That's just a thought on modern employment. Uh, if you were to look at it from a squad breakdown, uh, but I'd be curious what anybody else's thoughts were. I'll hop in there, Alex. I think you're got a good idea there because when I started out, you know, line infantry, first deployment, uh, jump into Iraq, I was a grenadier at first and <clears throat> went to sniper school and I wasn't in a sniper billet yet. So I became the squad designated marksman, but I quickly found out that due to the constant change and just rotation of positions that rifleman in the team, you know, your lowest guy on the totem pole, that was the easiest replaced. So if somebody had to go, somebody had to get cut, you lost that guy. And if you made that your SDM, you've lost your SDM right off the bat. That was the lowest priority on the totem pole because we want our grenadier, we want our saw gunner and we need our team leader. So having the team leader, having that skill set. I think that's absolutely a way to go because they're there, they can direct and control the fight and, you know, have that ability to engage out further if needed. And you got more job stability as the team leader than, you know, after the team leader, I'd say it's still going to be a saw gunner, you know, your machine gunner, but the grenadier and the rifleman, they're expendable. So the striker folks, uh, actually have in their MTO some some dude called the designated marksman. And in your squad, you've got, in the Army anyway, uh, two fire teams. Uh, one rifleman in one fire team is organizationally supposed to be, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the ideal, but the baseline is what's supposed to be is um, that one rifleman and that one fire team is the DM. And then the other rifleman, the other fire team, he's your anti-armored dude, uh, supposed to be. But is, is, is that the right answer though? And I, and I think you guys are hitting on things because the guy that you want needs to have a certain level of experience, maturity, uh, uh, and brain housing group that is, that is right for the job. And if you just give it to the low man totem pole, uh, in one way, maybe he'll stick around longer to make a counterpoint, perhaps, uh, because he's got more time to spend in that squad before he gets sh shifted out somewhere. I don't know. But but you're asking that fresh meat to to do this. I hate using the word advanced because every every soldier infantry dude should be able to do this. It um, I don't know that it's the right answer. But in the books, it's, you've got your rifleman as the guy. Now, I'm going to smoke crack right now and say, well, sh dang it, the, the the grenadier. What's his primary weapon? 
Well, it's in the name, right? Well, or is it? The, the primary weapon of the Grenadier nowadays is, is the freaking rifle. And I get the reason why that went into it. But if it's his rifle, then maybe he has better experience. Maybe he's got the brain housing for that job better than the rifleman. Maybe he should do it. But now he's got two special. I don't know what the answer is, but the brain has to match uh, the the person. And and again, you don't want turbulence in the unit so that people shift out as soon as you got them trained up. And the Army's notorious for that. As soon as we get people exactly where we want them, they promote up, they get cross-leveled, they go somewhere else, it disappears. And this can devolve later on into a rant about the problem of trainer trainer programs. But I'll leave that aside for now. Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, this, this is where I'm going to be a bit contrarian. Um, and it is experience-based. Speaking to the Grenadier and to the DM slash rifleman. Um, <clears throat> for a hot minute, as a fire team leader, I carried a 203. My thought process was, I can use this thing to mark targets. I can use this thing to lay smoke, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. If I'm late, but if I'm dropping 40 millimeter hate bombs, what am I not doing? I'm not fighting my fire team. I'm focused on dropping hate bombs. Fast forward, as a squad leader, when we first started getting ACOGs, I took the first ACOG that came down the pipe and put it on my right. And I rationalized it as, A, nobody in my squad shoots better than me. I can best effectively use it. B, if there is a shot that's going to be questioned, instead of ordering Joe Snuffy to take the shot, I'll take the shot. Because if somebody has to answer questions why the shot was taken, Joe Snuffy's going to be, oh, no, my squad leader told me to do it. I did it. What are your questions? And that's, it, it shortens the decision chain instead of telling Joe Snuffy, hey, that guy right there, no, not that window, the next window, shoot him. I already know what I want shot. <clears throat> but again, if I'm doing that, what am I not doing? I'm not fighting my two fire teams. As a team leader, you need to be fighting your fire team. As a squad leader, you need to be fighting your two fire teams and reporting what you got higher. If you take that priority weapon and put it in the hands of that junior leader, you're taking that junior leader out of his primary role. You can't conduct the band if you're playing the trumpet. That's what I'm hearing you say. And you're right. But, but it's this balancing act. It, it, you got the right person. And that right person mentally may not be the junior guy. So it's a quandary. And, and I don't know what the answer is. I, mean, so I really think my that... senior, it would be my senior rifleman. Yeah. There's nothing that doctrinally says your rifleman is going to be your junior man in your squad. It's going to be the dude that just got there. Well, I think the other thing you're talking about. Manning, <clears throat> your manning is on the leadership. Leadership has a responsibility to put the right person in the right role. And with that, I'm going to shut up. So I think the, the part that, that we have to talk about, because I do agree, like I said, you know, fighter leader concept, right. Is you've got to be the fighter and the leader. Uh, the beef that I would have is, is I agree, but it, like, what's your time? Like, what's a timetable? Like what's your kill clock from idea, like locate range and engage a target using that system. And then again, if you've got, if he's the guy with the lurf, now I can tell my a dub who is really who I'm fighting. Everybody else is there to support that guy. Um, you know, is, you know, I can give him the best, the best chance and then the best follow on correction, you know, to put, you know, large volumes of fire onto our target, you know, if we're talking basic, you know, battle drill one alpha, whatever. And then I can also follow it up with my shots, you know, based on it. But if you look at like, you know, I, I like to say that like six seconds is what it takes your average pro to fire a shot, right? That's within the bottom of your natural respiratory, uh, respiratory cycle, natural respiratory <clears throat> go into O2 and glycogen burn. So if you can't be able to locate range and engage from prone position with a weapon mounted laser range finder in a time limit of call it 15 to 20 seconds, you know, what has happened with your team in 15 to 20 seconds? The reality is in fire maneuver, 
not that fucking much, like maybe 15 meters of ground getting covered, maybe. Right. And that's all going to depend on terrain and cover and whatever else like that. So I, like, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I, I agree with it wholeheartedly. I just think we have to put a shot clock on it too and figure out like how much time are you pulling him out of the fight for each engagement versus what's happening while he's, he's in that engagement. And then go back to what, what Ian said is it's a wholly personnel dependent, which is why I would look for, you know, the more mature person that can actually handle those tasks and understand when it's time to fight when it's time to lead and do it both correctly, which is obviously not an easy thing to do, but hopefully if we groom them into that position, that's how it works. The other thing that before I just, you know, made my argument, uh, now let, me, let me shoot holes in my own argument. Um, you know, I, cause I didn't really think about it. You know, when you're running like a Mark 12, it looks a lot like an a four or a two, right? When you're running a giant fuck off tan thing that looks nothing like those around you. Well, now he's the guy giving orders and commands the guy with the radio and the guy with the weird gun, he's definitely getting it first, like hundred percent hands down, getting it first. Right. So again, you're just really stacking the deck against him. So uh, I don't know. You better be good or paint that shit black or something. I don't know. When we spec'd out a gun for our Cal guardsmen going forward as DMS, everyone wanted bipods and it, and it kind of, it, it's exactly what you're saying. You don't want bipods on that. Use your pack. Like the more distinctive you look, the more you look like a high payoff target, the very people that we want our own DMs to go out and engage. So it's not always like, <laughs> never mind. You guys know what I'm saying. What are you thinking, Chad? Well, I was a team leader <laughs> as the DM, and there's a whole lot of nuance to it, obviously, over 20 years, a whole lot of stuff being learned. Um, being stuck with a fixed power optic. Um, the benefits as a team leader, uh, you're able to see better. You're able to see more, see further. Uh, and that helps, you know, in placing your team, team members, uh, covering long sectors. But that uh, has all changed with the advent and adoption of Vero power optics. And I'm talking low power and it's just not low power It is low to mid power variable optics with what the Marine Corps has gone to. With those VCOGs, they got one to eights, I believe. And that's a squad optic, not squad designated marksman. That's squad, everybody's got it now. So that, it really changes the game a bit here. Um, but I, I it's really <clears throat> easy to think about special problems. Um, it, uh, squad on a squad assault, everybody online doing fire team, buddy bounds, whatever. What's your roles in, as a des, uh, squad designated marksman? Um, you're running with a rifle for I'm up. He sees me. I'm down. You can to try to find a firing position if you can. And when it's, you're trying to get up and move, you get up and move and you're gauging whatever you can see, or you're putting immediate suppression on known target areas, right? Nothing to do with taking time to laser target, nothing to, you know, take a precision shot. You're not taking precision shots after five bounds, probably not after two bounds. I'm definitely not after one bound, um, especially now. So uh, keeping, I would say re reality-based stuff going on here, but it, it's another tool. Like I had, I was a grenadier too, as a team leader in the Marine Corps. Like we all had the stupid 203s. What I love the 203 for more than anything, was like a big honk and barrel weight. And I was a lot more accurate with the rifle in a standing position. Um, secondary reason I love firing off uh, a loom rounds flat trajectory, but the, that went away when I got the optic and that's just what it was. So now I got a different piece of kit. I got to figure it out, but it really wasn't a, it wasn't a, a hindrance to my job or my role as the team leader. Um, Vice was my role as a team leader, a hindrance to the role of a squad designated marksman is the question because now I got to get up and move and check positions. Now, if my rifle and optic combo are covering a gap or key terrain or threat area, whatever you want to call it. Um, if I have to get up and do my job as Lance coconut or coconut, um, are, am I leaving my rifle there for the next capable guy to fall in on it? So we're not leaving a gap or who's going to fill that gap when I get up to go relief post or whatever. So, um, not to go too far down the rabbit trail, but the, back to the first thing I said, the Marine Corps has gone to something now that might even change the game as far as like SDMs, because now everybody's got these optics 
And obviously the shortfall has always been, or seems to be recurrent across the services is the due diligence with training and employment and getting the right, not just the right guys with the right Indian, the right bow, the right arrow, but teach them how to use the thing and give them the right arrows for it and train his command and how to employ when he gets there. Um, that seems to be the bigger problem. It has been institutionally for a while. Does so that make sense? The new, the new Marine Corps qual that rolled out in conjunction with, or right on the heels of the wide fielding of that, of the VCOG. I mean, it does put a premium at that ability to maximize the use of that optics. So I think they're doing a pretty good job on that. And where I would say, <clears throat> you know, where I would, I would caution guys getting too sucked down the rabbit hole between like super snipery shit and then fighting with these gun shit is we're talking about being able to use that laser range finder stuff or whatever, to take a precision shot. That's fine from that 300 to 600 field. But if you're fighting as your team in the final assault of one alpha and you're within 300, well then you're within max point blank or modified max point blank of those targets. Anyway, you're clearing crosshairs and firing, right? So it really comes down to understanding the training and then breaking them down of like how and when to do what they need to do. Um, you know, and like stripping out all the stuff they don't need uh, and then giving them the tools that they need to do. And goes back to that speed portion of overmatch, right? Within 300, it's anybody's game, dude. You know, um, you got to be first to hit. You got to do it quick. And there's something we're leaving out here. We're talking about bounding and taking 500 meter shots, bounding and taking 600 meter shots. It's not the rifleman's role. It's not the DM's role. If you're bounding, well, First of all, if you're bounding 600 meters, you're, you're going to be hating life. I think I remember Jose in a modcast about five years ago saying, I'm not bounding that shit. I'm dropping mortars on it. Yes. But if you're in that kind of fight, why are you worried about it? You've got belt feds to handle that shit. You probably have an that's Aggie good. officer if you're bounded that far. I'm just yeah, saying. That, that's that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Like if you're if you're gonna be bounding, you're gonna be within the last couple hundred meters. You're gonna be inside of max point blank or modified max point blank. You're not gonna be using that lerf. Now, if I'm outside of that, I want to use that lerf to direct fire. So that's awesome. I can also use it as an aid to polar plot for my call for fire missions. So again, there's more things provided you have a more well trained individual uh, at the helm. Yes, and the DM's role, at least in the Army, Marine Corps DDM stuff marine corps comma ddn two different things um <clears throat> might be different y'all can y'all can speak to that doctrine but in the army your dm is a member of that fire team until they reach wherever they're reaching are they setting up a defense are they taking an objective and holding that objective which now becomes a hasty defense that's when the dm becomes a dm until that moment He's just a dude in the squad with a rifle. Yeah, I like that we're all able to argue with ourselves on these topics because the people with the simple, easy answers typically don't, should not be answering. <laughs> if that makes any sense. <laughs> I just like it. So what you're saying is the answer is it depends. Not just that. I think to what he just was you know saying and to put some more color on that picture like we're not even arguing i don't think that's just how like complex this is because you add this role with whatever kid it is but those identifiers to it boom here you go and that just that changes so many things second third order effects like there are a lot of changes that go into play and meanwhile i gotta run a gun with this bad boy here's your bipod back, you know, like where's my cat tail. All right. Back to one, like everybody else, you know, you for clarity, I meant that we we're able to argue with our own selves, own selves. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Not, not that we're well, I was clarifying right. your clarification of your clarif uh. So should we go to the next though? You know, based on the like, discussion, it sounds like we already hit it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. So what is that topic there, Matt? You're still driving the ship. So we did historical, modern concept, the role, employment, and mission. That kind of was kind of covered, wasn't it? So because the term exists in the LE world and state outside of the Army and Marine Corps, uh, how do you, I mean, is it simply the palatable term for sniper? 
or is no. a DM well, just it depends on the area. That shows up with skills. Depends on the area because so for my agency, everyone has some form of a 16 inch AR 15 with some form of a red dot. If policy allowed for it, or there was if if a weapon was issued with some kind of a magnified optic for the purposes of more precise. The, seriously, though, at the at the ranges we're talking, we're yeah, um, I could see. Okay, you're the designated whatever, whatever. With with uh, larger agencies, Salt Lake PD, for example, uh, a few years ago, actually, it's more than a few. A bunch of years ago, started a like a DMR patrol rifle program, where everyone has a patrol rifle, but then there are specific officers that did have a magnified optic. And what does Pat Rogers say, or say, what did he say about magnified optics? They're not helping you shoot better; they're only ha- helping you see better. Um, so, um, really, it, it depends. Because I worked for a smaller agency, and I had I had my SPR in my truck too, because of the distances that I was working now they, with wide open spare, uh, wide open areas. Um, there was no cover anywhere other than my truck. And so if I'm, if I'm responding to something and I want to maintain a, a safer distance, I want that magnification, but I also don't want to drive up right to the door, uh, to the door. And yeah. So it depends. I'll, I'll say that, you know, <clears throat> Two things. So one, not to not to argue with Uncle Pat, but magnified optics absolutely let you shoot better because you have a more consistent point of aim. You can get better the mechanical accuracy or close to the mechanical accuracy of the weapon system. Uh, so hundred percent. Yeah, not to argue with him because he can't he can't defend himself. But I would I would suggest that that might not be as, good points. as true as it maybe once was nowadays. Right. The second part, a hundred percent agree with Matt, that it is wholly dependent on the area of the country you're talking about, what the politics of that area are and how it rolls out. And then like, there's a lot of the times you're looking at from, from my experience out in the world with law enforcement, they kind of fall into uh, maybe two or three buckets in terms of how they roll this out. So like Matt was just talking about an agency where you have a one to whatever ratio of red dot guns to a magnified optic gun, or it is in addition to uh, call it the SWAT sniper suite of weapon systems, if they will, so they can draw on it for uh, event overwatch or other things where fast flash trajectory in a way that works, uh, it works out really well. Um, so it really is, it really comes down to what the desire of the agency is. I also think geogra- uh, geography of the area, you know, some stuff out West. I mean, even, you know, what we'd be like, they're running a DMR. It's like, no, they're just using it for animal control and they want the bigger caliber, right? Like, you know, so there's other stuff to think about, um, with on the, on the law enforcement side of the house. And, and it's, it's, you can see everything because it means different things to different people. Um, from hey, I've got an 11 inch gun with a red dot or a uh, excuse me, like an LPVA on it. Like, this is my DMR gun. I'm like, well, I mean, the reality is, you know, patrol rifle shot to 200 is is covering a pretty good. I think right now the longest patrol rifle shot document in the U.S. is like 300 yards. I think it was Phoenix PD that did it, uh, which is a pretty good huck for for your patrol rifle guys. And I actually believe it was Iron Sights. Um, Jeff Feltz from Center Mass is trying to put together a survey for patrol rifles similar to what the ASA did for snipers. And and that was when I talked to him, what he had pushed or uh, what his data gathering had led to uh, thus far. Um, But no, so I mean, it really comes down to like, you know, my father-in-law, for example, started a, a, a program here for one of the, the states up in New England over 25, almost 30 years ago called Extended Range Patrol Rifle. And it was, you know, A2 carry handles with ACOGs on top, you know, and it, their, their line in the sand was 200 yards, right? So, you know, it really comes down to the application uh, because of, you know, hey, they're going to be shooting duty loads, probably not match for your patrol guys. Your SWAT guys might have a separate line item for ammunition. So they do get, you know, match grade ammunition that aids in consistency and can push that distance further. Um, there's just a lot when it comes down to developing that program, because they have to not only figure out what gun they want, they got to figure out what the program they want is. And what does that selection process look like? What was that rollout look like? What is that sustainment training, net training, et cetera? You know, it's, it's everything that we're talking about on the army side, but just much smaller because of the size. All I took away from that is that you like arguing with dead people. That's all I, that's all I got. <laughs> Nothing else. So to wrap up the army thing, I think it's important to point 
well, for the army people that are out there that are still in, there is a task report that goes into the, uh, what you're supposed to be able to do. There's only one that I've only found one, maybe there's smarter army people out there, but because I can't refer to it, uh, I will refer to something that is open to everyone's downloading skills on army publishing directorate. So first thing I did was I, I looked at the striker brigades, uh, the SBCTs out there, striker brigade combat teams. Uh, Cause right now they're the only real place in the army where this, this dude kind of exists uh, as in a black and white manner in terms of uh, the organizational chart. They exist elsewhere. Don't, don't get butt hurt everyone else. But so I looked at how they employ them and would you believe it? I only found two of their publications that mentions the guy or girl. And in each of those instances, it appeared only once in one paragraph and it had to do with overwatch. Uh, it's, it's an overwatchy thingy. Uh, so I dug out the, the infantry books and um, surprisingly, well, maybe not so surprisingly, there is a crowd control. There's a book out there for crowd control. And it actually talks about uh, the DM a little bit more than the infantry guys. And again, it talks about crowd control. So um, as a, a, a army book doctrine purpose, uh, there's a lot in there when it comes to crowd control. And, and not that you're controlling the crowd by shooting them. Don't, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking like you use them to observe you use them to pick out some dude wasn't that wasn't that strategy used at kent state i mean that i was just gonna say this. i mean this in an overseas context not domestically um so if there's a guy out there that uh, or gal out there that is identified uh from that overwatch position they can take that uh they can make that engagement or at least that's what they're supposed to do uh but part and parcel to that is also your observation skills you know, the Marine Corps has this combat hunter program. Army has advanced situational awareness. You know, are you able to read the crowd? Who, who's the troublemaker out there, perhaps? Who's the who's the guy that uh, or gal that represents a, a lethal threat and is compliant with the ROE for you to engage? So, you know, and, and once you reach the overwatch position, if it is elevated, you got to have someone there that understands uh, where he should be looking what he needs to be concerned with, his communication. All these things I'm talking about, what goes into the skills, the role that the DM has, other than just pulling the trigger. Because when it comes to training them up as the, your local commander, if not at school, you're probably going to want to know these things so that they can execute the role over and above just making a shot. And it isn't always just those extended range shots either. It's the, those those close-up shots that require a high degree of of, of high accuracy, high precision. So um, I, I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way as to what the army uh, plans to do with these guys. Cause like Terrell said, the cart or the horse was before the cart on this thing. They roll these things out and there's really no, there's no qualification course of fire that's consistent across the army. We'll, we'll hit on that later. I think uh, nor is there a standardized training program, although it has been pushed out to, there's a schoolhouse in Arkansas with the National Guard. They've got a SDM program. Lots of troop schools at the various RTIs in different states. Regional training institutes have one. I know AMU had the effort back in the day. Uh, I And they were supplemented by um, CRP, not CRP, uh, the civilian guys. The um, CMP. CMP. CMP guys to help alleviate the load. Uh, I know also that Back in 2011, I think it was, the SF dudes had their own uh, SDM program. Hell, why am I making this up? I can tell you what they called them. It's a 14 day thing called a, uh, what is it, special purpose designated mark? I don't know what the hell it is. But anyway, uh, there are schoolhouses for, but as far as a, a the overarching one schoolhouse for the Army, there really isn't one. So it's very inconsistent. And I think later on we might talk about uh, what if we had our magic wand, a, a, a course of fire for qualification, sustainment training, and then ad advancement. I don't want to say advancement, like 
further sprinkles on the Sunday training should look like. But that's all I got to say about that. So we went over LE, kind of. You uh, required capabilities to support the role employment mission. Yes. I think we're talking about the rifle itself, right? Like, like what what the rifle spec should be, or or what? I'm going off your notes. Well, I don't know. I'm just aggregating everything that people threw at me like mud on the wall when I was writing this thing up, you jerk. Well, considering um, this, uh, yes. at the core of the topic is the rifle. Yes. Because you can't be the role without having the group of people well, that you're supporting. Well, the, the hardware should support the use. So we kind of laid out the use. but So now it's a matter of getting the hardware that can do the things that we say it should do. Right? So... Chad, what, what did you guys have uh, for your folks when you were doing this stuff? You talk about state or Marine Corps? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, one one thing that came to mind when y'all were talking about um, the strikers and Overwatch, um, how we potentially did it wrong, could have done it better, or things we did right. I was in a boat company doing boat raids and once we were ashore it was just a raid and so looking back we had our set roles within the company as platoons and so one platoon would be the special skills as far as climbing and scout swimmers and all that stuff that was first platoon second platoon was always assault element third platoon was more support and so they'd be on blocking positions, support fire positions and stuff on the objective. Um, and they were with machine guns and mortars attachments. Now, where would the, the DMs in that company be best served? Would it be the guys setting caving ladders on the beach? Would it be with the guys out on a road somewhere with Claymore set? Or would it be with the guys assaulting the objectives or be the guys laying in a puddle of piss, freezing their asses off next to a section of two forties. Um, perhaps there should be some flexibility at the command level on where they're going to allocate these guns and these roles to that. You're not going to be spreading them one for one on, on the uh, old into of the organization where every fire team has one. Do you need that? But it, like I said, the platoons, the squads fall into their specialties at times, in my experience. And we were straight up forcing those specialties where DM wouldn't, wouldn't have worked for probably two of the, th of the three rifle platoons in our company. And then once we were actually out doing real world stuff, I'm like, oh, great. Now I'm in a crappy position. I can't even really rely, you know, use it here until it's a, you know, chance contact or pop up engagement. Um, and I'm challenging somebody close range or at distance. Um, I wasn't set in setting my uh, range and my range fan and doing uh, doing my cards. I had none of that. So now I'm swagging it, right? So to the point, I think there needs to be unit level flexibility, commander's discretion or senior NCO uh, discretion, whoever's been there a while and understands it to put those where they're best served uh, to the mission. Chad brings up an interesting point. So before uh, 2030 uh, rolled out and the Marine Corps used to have its company breakdown like it was, they had, you know, a weapons platoon while we were in the rear before we chalked out and then we would get, you know, they would take a squad machine gunners, chalk it one team to each platoon. Same thing with 60 millimeter mortars, assaultment, et cetera, because that was that kind of like the specialized skill platoon. So while everybody like, you know, while line platoons were doing line stuff, specialized guys could go work their own ranges, their own training, their own, et cetera. Right. So again, there's, there's, 
kind of an idea there. Maybe on the army side of the house, you're pushing the weapon squad. So they get to work their own training cycle uh, before getting plugged back in. The beef to that though, and like Ian said, we we argue with our own ideas. Uh, the beef to that is that now the the leader, the leadership of that squad or team doesn't get to use that asset or practice using that asset until it's go time. So I don't know. You know, that reminds me of the 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 your grenadiers that were this is an example. Uh this is not the topic, but uh, your your grenade guy, he's supposed to cover the, the space that your machine gunners can't get at. How often do we see those bubbas training with the machine gunners, for example? Uh, it's, I'm not, and they should be. And I think that's what you're getting at, Alex. They, they, they should be able to, uh, I'm babbling. I'm just realizing it. But um, yes, no, commanders should be able to task organize for the mission and not for administrative convenience. So if you do need to consolidate into your reserve or your security element, the other DM dudes into one position or, you know, call them together into one uh, ad hoc uh, element that might be co-located, might not be co-located, then, then they should absolutely have that, that, that flexibility. I, I agree with you, uh, um, Alex. All right. I think we call that like the super squad and that gives you cool, like, you know, abbreviation to get it tattooed and branded on your arms too. <laughs> what goes around, man. Yeah. But to the machine gun range, that those are awesome, awesome opportunities for DMs to put in work. Range estimation, uh, unknown ranges, uh, mistrills, all that stuff, because you have all the stuff out there, especially like it plays like Quantico and where they still put in like echelons of like little crazy Ivans or whatnot out there where you can blink away. We did that all the time at FTU. And so like we'd have machine gun shoot gun, but we'd also have like a sasser over here and some other stuff. And like people get a little trigger time on the side, but also like we'd be sneaking it in too and we could. Perfect opportunity. You have the SDZ for everything there. So just call in your largest donut and just go to work, put it in a lot, get your ammo allotments right. And make sure you have your training schedule set so you can actually give it due diligence. And that'd be awesome. It'll work. Easy. So I just brought up in side chat. I don't know if you guys saw, but it looks like I might need to uh, end a little sooner than anticipated. Before I do that, so far we've been talking about guns. It sounds like most of you guys, maybe hopefully all of you guys are able to come back to continue the discussion. I think we can focus more on the actual role and the person in the next episode. But there is one thing that we haven't discussed, and that's the actual features of the weapon itself. What are the necessary, in your guys' opinion, and, and this is going to be based on role and mission and all that, but what are things that make something a marksmanship rifle versus a standard rifle, Alex? Uh, it comes down to, to consistency of, of accuracy and precision, uh, in my opinion, right? It's got to have, I mean, we could get super nerdy and be like, it's got to be a lightweight, shoulder-fired, magazine-fed, gas-operated system with an optical sight. But, you know, again, again, I like to think of, I like what I like, you know, for a reason based on my experiences and based on my application with that and then how I apply it now and how I teach it now, we do a lot coming in out of vehicles. So the longer something gets, the more that sucks. Um, you know, again, I'm still, you know, I'm still well within, you know, supersonic range, uh, depending on load, you know, to, you know, beyond six, almost 700 yards. So again, I can maintain accuracy to that distance and self spot based on my magnification selection. Right. So, uh, I choose a certain round, uh, or, or I, I like to run five, five, six, uh, 77 grain match, not two, two, three. Cause I want the extra velocity for danger space. It's becoming increasingly more difficult, uh, to find somebody who actually produce it in quantity. Um, and I like shooting the heavy for caliber stuff. So it gives me enough splash to self spot. It's the same thing as like why you're shooting, you know, four sixteen at two miles instead of three thirty eight enabler. So I can see more splash and make my adjustment. Right. So, um, and then the end of the day, like I've always said, and like I said on the last one, you know, you've got to check ride your stuff. You know, if you're going to say it's zero to six, it doesn't mean zero and then go to six. It means you have to actually put it through its paces 
through an SRM or short range marksmanship package to ensure that you can be, you're not a liability to yourself, your team, your squad, or, or your department, or whoever you're working with, because you cannot be as fast as required as another patrol rifle would be up front or another M4 style rifle would be. Uh, but then you also have to be able to hang with a high degree, I would say greater than 80% hit probability to those distances, like we've spoken about that three to 600 threshold, that would be as a one man band. So you need to be able to locate range and engage it, whatever that engagement sequence looks like um, by yourself. And that's, that's the left and right lateral limits that I would draw. Next. I'm waiting for others. I don't want to be the guy. Oh, you're that guy. No. Terrell, go. I'm uh, kind of uh, echoing Alex. Uh, I like a 5.56. Five, uh, it's ammunition common to all. It's a lot easier to get uh, better 5.56 five, ammo than it is to try to find, you know, when it comes to 7.62, everybody always wants to hand you some machine gun ammo. You know, you just break off a belt, and that is always problematic. Uh, some, sometimes you get good ammo, sometimes you don't. And it's a lot easier to, to find a uh, good 556 five, ammo and others won't try to steal it from you all the time like they will if you have good, you know, uh, good match ammo for a uh, 762 or 308, if you will. So I like the 556 five, ammo. Uh, 77 grain, happen to have a thousand rounds sit right over there. Uh, and an optic for an optic for me, that's a an optic uh, at least eight power. Um, maybe my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, but I prefer a a one to eight or a two to ten, something like that for a, a, an optic at the minimum. And I'd like to put a red dot off the uh, hang it either on top or off to the side, whatever you whatever you prefer. Uh, I don't necessarily need bipods on it because it's like I said, it's something else to grab onto. And I don't need it to, for it to be a super long barrel either. I mean, we're finding you can do pretty good stuff with uh, a barrel that's not as long as we used to think that we needed an 18 or a 20 inch barrel. Uh, I have a Douglas barrel uh, from the AMU somehow, fell off a truck gun. Uh, actually, a guy I used to work at AMU built it for me. And it's a great gun, but I don't need the barrel that long anymore. Uh, especially when you're talking about a stock, I like to have a collapsible stock or maybe a loft folder on it so I can fold it up a little bit smaller and get it out in and out of a vehicle. Those are some of the things I would look at. Just something comfortable. And it's also, there's a nice weight difference between a uh, 5.56 gun and a 7.62 gun. The weight difference, I think you'll notice when you're doing ready up coming in a room because you got to be part of a squad. Uh, it gets really tiring really quick trying to lift up 762 gas gun to your face over and over and over. It gets really old. Especially if you hang a can off the end, that makes it even heavier. You know, that's that, that not fun. I don't know. I, I ramble. Chad. I'll go. That was great, Terrell. I agree in that you need squad common ammunition and feeding devices. Uh, it needs to not only shoot the special stuff, but it needs to shoot the not bulk pack, but what your units run it. So if you're if where you're at is still shooting green tip, it needs to be able to handle it with green tip. Two an acceptable minimum, but understanding that there's a trade-off. Um, I view the, the DM, he's an enhanced rifleman. He's able to deliver precision, discretionary fires at select targets and in under time to a standard. Now, whatever goes on the gun needs to fit the role in the, gun itself needs to fit the role within your team within 
your squad and you're always under observation. So I'm not talking about, we're trying to smuggle this thing around. It just needs to fit. Like, like what Terrell was just saying about running into a room with like a, a 110 or a Mark 11, like you start touching off 762 in a small room, man. Like have fun with that. You can keep that noise. Um, but having a 556 five, gun, it just, I mean, split times up close, all of that stuff. Like if I were to be setting up a course of fire, like if I, if I could redo the DM thing at state, it would follow a progression of, all right, this is your M4A1. All right, let's go. Well, no, here's your Mark 12. Guess what? You're doing everything else everybody else is doing, but now you have all the extra shit on it. And oh, when you're shooting the DS qualification score or qual course for record, and not just then, but every time. But whenever you're doing this, guess what? Everybody has Izzy. Guess what? This is what you have. Three by five card on the face, and you have an eight-inch circle. Those are your only acceptable target zones. Given the course of fire, you have to own your shots. You're not getting to pick and choose what you feel more comfortable with at times. Um, less banging at the hundred, like everybody else. You're giving me that. That would suffice for the FBI cold bore shots. You're taking your shots at a hundred yards on the Izzy phase. Um, but it's integrated within what everybody else is doing. And throughout training guess what? You're being called upon to now take those discretionary shots, lacing shots through a sea of targets. Like you're, you're training for the role you're expected to fulfill. The gun needs to be the tool for that job. And to me, it's a good general purpose gun. It's reflective of what most people will do or grab whenever they're going to go and shoot yotes or they're just going to go and bust pigs. Like it's that gun that's good up close, but also guess what? <laughs> pull over, hold off, and send it and shoot them until they change shape. That's just my concept of it all where I'm at at this point in time because the whole rigmarole of jousting snipers over it, which is just wasted effort. Like, I'd rather just learn from the snipers to make me more effective as a DM. It's not like I'm going to get a tab or anything cool or a cool necklace over it. I don't want any of that stuff. I want the cool gun so I do my job better, right? Um, so that's where I'm at with the, what the tool is. The tool needs to fit, not just the shooter law folder. Excellent, excellent point. Um, it needs to fit within the role of the team. It does not need to become the third tripod that now you're having to lug around everywhere. Nobody wants to carry the base plate. I mean, the DMR gun, right? Like it needs to be value added for the cost of acquiring it and putting it to service. Chad said joust little known fact. He used to do jousting. Medieval times, people. Yeah, I want to see my long, glorious hair. There are videos on YouTube. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) It's a great job leaving the fleet. That's for sure. It's awesome. Mike and John. If I'm specking out a a DM rifle, uh, one one thing I don't hear anybody hit on is like an accuracy standard. And I'm going to go a, a two minute capable system and, you know, as my bare minimum standard. Yeah, you know, I consider sniper grade one minute of angle. Uh, DM systems, I consider a two minute angle system. You know, you know, baseline minimum accuracy, you know, n- not shooter dependent there. And I'm going to lean towards five, five, six. Uh, I want that team squad commonality, heavy for caliber, the 77 grain. Uh, when it comes to optics, you know, for somebody who was like, you know, raised in the military initially on fixed power stuff, you know, four power ACOG, 10 power sniper scope, stuff like that. Um, I, I've never found a situation where I wished for less magnification, but I've been in plenty of situations where I wanted more because I could never see too good. I want to be able to ID. I want to be able to see clearly and I'm more in that range of like the, the four to 16s, the three to 18, three to 15s, you know, whatever the flavor is, I have no problem running a three or four power optic on the low end, you know, but having that mid range uh, magnification level, you know, in the, in the mid teens at, on the upper end, like I've never found that as a disadvantage. You know, I can never see too good, you know, for a gunfight and, you know, Offset red dots, great. Um, 
you know, for, for the close in stuff, but that comes with special training. You know, you have to train to use that red dot, offset red dot, you know, it's because everybody's going to default to the scope, you know, to their, you know, common denominator of training, you know, you have to be prepared to run that offset red dot. And, you know, I'm looking two minute gun quality barrel. I don't care about barrel length. I don't care if it's a 14 and a half inch all the way up to a 20 inch barrel. As long as I've got a quality barrel inside of a free float tube. I want a fight and gun capable of two minutes of angle or less that has optics that can cover from, you know, point blank distance, which I can run that three X. I can run that four X at point blank all the way out to whatever I'm expected to as that DM designated marksman. Yeah. If doctrine says that's 600 meters, I want magnification that can easily handle 600 meters. I, I know Ridgeline, you know, uh, I think one of their rules of thumb was two X per hundred yards. You know, 600, that's 12X minimum, you know, going off of that just rule of thumb. And I'm all for that, that 12 to 18 range, somewhere in there for the higher end. That, that's what I'm going to go with. I was actually yeah, I just, a, I was ahead. just about to ask you about twice the yardage as far as power. And that's, that's something that I've been telling people ever since I realized that, um, shooting at a head size target at 500, I was absolutely maxed out at 10. And I was like, man, I started backing it off. And I realized that was a correlation I drew. And that's what I just kind of took with me. So I'm kind of glad to hear that somebody else smarter and more experienced than me is saying that a couple of people are. Um, questions about that power though, um, on the, on the mid to upper end, do you not find issues with, uh, Mirage starting to get in the way of things. If you're um, trying to do that, does that become a limiting factor if you're relying on those mid to upper range power optics at those distances? It, it, I don't think I'm handicapped by Mirage playing a factor there because I'm thinking – once that's playing a fact, that's more of like sniper role, not necessarily DM role. So when I think DM, I'm thinking a gunfighter that's a member of the team, member of the squad that is capable of handling zero to six. No, and so what, I think what he's getting at is some mirage coming off. So that's really going to come down to suppress round, suppress and rate of fire. Uh, Cause it's going to be how much, how much heat's coming off that can and disturbing your, your side picture. Uh, right. which you can get a little bit easier with just dialing down the magnification again. I mean, you got to get, you know, you, you're, you're pretty decent way into an engagement uh, before it starts to work itself out. And that, you know, again, suppress unsuppress, it, it makes a difference. Yeah. Th thanks for that. Um, the reason why I brought that up, I wasn't trying to diverge too far. You had said you, you had spoken about how you hadn't had any issues with wanting more power, needing more power, like, um, or wanting less power. Sorry if I terrible paraphrase, that's what came to mind. I was like, what about the Mirage issue? Thanks, Fred. Mike. Mike. All right. Um, a couple things. Absolutely agree, free float tube. Absolutely agree, two minute gun. Uh, that's a threshold. Objective should be one minute. Um, <clears throat> magnification, concur there. I will say, though, either or offset red dot or a true one in bottom with daylight bright illuminated reticle because he has to have that close CQB capable optic on the gun. So a true one or an offset red dot, uh, one to six being the absolute bare minimum, one to eight, one to 10 being preferred, one to 12 if there's a good one to 12 out there would be great. Uh, the gun needs to be uh, needs to share ammo commonality. I see Scott Peterson comment at six eight by fifty one greater than five five six DMR. Agreed. Uh, with that, I know why the Army went to seven six two as a DMR. I got it fully tracking, but I think there has there there should be commonality to be able to cross load ammunition within the squad. If that dude runs out of seventy seven grain. He needs to be able to get a mag off of somebody else, throw it in his gun, and go to work. And he should know the data for both loads. Hey, man, here's a mag of EPR. 
got it. I got witness marks on my turret cap. It's not going to be a, a re-zero, so it's not going to be precise, but I can dial it that couple of clicks, whatever it is, the difference between 77 and EPR, and still do work. You should have commonality of ammo. And one thing I think we tend to overlook is we like to look at optics, but these dudes are fighting a day and night. So he, he needs to have a clip on night vision or a clip on thermal because target detection, target ID is a thing in all light conditions. And besides that, y'all, y'all knocked it out of the park. I'll bring one thing up, Mike, on the, on the true one X piece with the optics versus an offset red dot. And why I would say offset red dot would probably be like a, a mandatory for me versus a, a true one X is that true one X daylight bright. Usually those illuminators don't last very long and the battery commonality is pretty shit across anything else. And say so if I have like two days with my scope that runs versus that same battery, why I might not have a ton of them. Like my endpoint's not going to go down the 2032 and a T1 offset isn't going to go down for a year long deployment. You know what I mean? Versus that do not like my old mark six, one to six, dude, if I like left the thing on, took a piss and came back, the battery would run out. Like it, it was just terrible battery life. Right. Um, but you know, it's just something to think about and for, for that, because I think a lot of us think in the, in the terms of like uh, going to the range day and we're like, yeah, I can do everything I want with that. But when you look at like, what's a, uh, especially in the military side, like what's a full deployment look like, then we, those issues start to creep up. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not emotionally tied to a one X. A four to 16 with a offset red dot, cool. But if I don't have an offset red dot, I need a true one X with a daylight bright illuminated. The only problem I have with some of the, when we have to get into bigger optics is they get heavier and heavier and heavier. And it's cool if you're laying on your belly or you're up on a stage where you're shooting off something supported. But if you're trying to actually fight with a rifle, it gets tiring having to lift a uh, uh, a heavier scope up to your face all the time. So that's why I prefer something a little bit lighter. But uh, I think Chad was on it when he was talking about two times the uh, the range. So, you know, everyone, it used to be 1x per, per 100. And yes, you can hit with 1x per 100, but I need the guy to do a little bit better than just hit. You know, I need him to be that uh, that one who can take the discriminatory target that we need him to take. And to follow that up, uh, Terrell, uh, that discrimination aspect, it's not enough just to detect, but to identify. And yeah, you can shoot with one X per hundred, but having that extra magnification uh, gives the person the ability to really see what's going on and i'm not saying anything you don't know i'm just kind of explaining it out to the others out there that um uh, detect identify and decide you know I'm, I'm getting at the direct fire engagement process so your optic needs to help you do that but first and foremost the, the weapon needs to be able to keep up with everything else that the other dudes in the squad are doing we've hit upon that so many times already but that's first and foremost for me uh and then when i tell folks where the uh, priorities of work are when it comes to AR guns, AR pattern guns for this type of upgrade or this type of role or capability is you've got, you have to address the way you interact with the target, the way you interact with the rifle and the way the rifle interacts with the bullet. Let's set aside the, the projectile, the cartridge for now. So the optic, the aiming system, what, what, how, how can you repeatedly see that target clearly, distinctly, and and gather the information you need through that thing. Um, the way you interact with the rifle. So uh, the trigger, uh, the, the handguard, the handguard bridges into the way the rifle interacts with the bullet. So the barrel, but you can't separate the barrel out from that free float tube. And then the free float tube you choose, you know, it, it needs to be rigid enough to not act as a breaker bar on that on that barrel nut um because just because you have a free float tube and, and they've done studies on this 
if you put a certain amount of pressure on that free flow to you, depending on which one it is, even though, even though it's not actually touching the barrel, the breaker bar effect on that barrel nut, you just, you still deviate those shots and people don't appreciate that. So then they get, then, then you start seeing these crazy ultra light hand guards that are super flexy that if you've got an enabler mounted on the hand guard, now you're deflecting that thing. Um, and then if it's too super ultra rigid and you're doing crazy loading into it, now you worry about that translating to the barrel. It, it's this wacky thing. All right. So um, optic trigger barrel hand guard, um, projectile needs to be able to do what you need it to do at whatever distance you need to do it at. That's a cop-out answer, but it's true. And it needs to be squat common. So, uh, or at least capable of being squat common, not that it's ideal. Uh, beyond that, I'll, I'll leave the specs, the exact specs up to others to figure out, but you, you need to hit, the, those are your priorities of work. Everything else I think is, is sec is secondary to those lines of effort, those priorities then it comes down to personal preference on the stock, on, on other doodads. But unless you can keep up and do the exact same things the rest of your squad mates are doing, then, then I mean, that's your envelope right there in terms of form factor. So, so that's what I got to say. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is it right here. 14.5 suppressed, 4 to 16 offset red dot, 2124 LR. This whole thing with a 20 round loaded mag bipod as it sits is 13 flat pounds with the CNV on it. I take it off. It's 11 pounds flat. It's, it's wieldy. The balance point with the CNVD off is right here on the gun. It's, uh, so it floats nice. Now I do run a bipod because one, if you do any buy range estimation um, at the distances that somebody be observing me from, we're not in a, a, a near ambush. Uh, you're going to start to see that fade away. Same thing as like hands or arms fading away as you get to distance. Uh, but my wobble zone can be immediately decreased getting into prone position quickly off snapshots and can help me interface with barricades or positions, artificial or environmental supports out in the world. Um, dude, that to me is, there's nothing I can't do with that gun. Like, and if you're on the, if you're on the receiving end, you're going to have a really bad day. Right. Um, and that's day or night in most weather, you know? Awesome discussion. So for those of you that are just joining us, we're going to stop. We will continue. Uh, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a follow up. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a couple of the additional panelists who were supposed to be here. Uh, they'll show up. Maybe. So right now we're going to go into the closing thoughts and then also plugs. Again, I'm going to say my favorite thing to say make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. So we've been talking for over two hours now. You've heard from these guys. You've had an idea of what their position on things are. Pay attention when they're plugging things. If they're bringing up their own pages, their own companies, if you like what they said, make sure you're giving them like subscriptions and all that other kind of stuff. Same for primary and secondary. Hit that like button. John, final thoughts and plugs. Okay. I know we really did get interesting to uh, train in tonight um, and concepts of it, but if I'm going to plug anybody, I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug Ridgeline. I've been through their scoped carbine. Uh, I'm going to plug quantified performance. Uh, I've shot their matches for, you know, about a year and a half now and for a place to learn and test the skill set, those two places, you know, go to Ridgeline and learn and go apply the stuff in like a, a quantified performance match. And you're going to learn what it takes to cover that ground from point blank out to, you know, X distance, you know, 600, 700, 800, you know, whatever the line in the sand is. And you're going to do it for multiple positions. You're going to do it from, you know, in a variety of conditions. And that's where you're going to see what works, what doesn't work. And I can't recommend that stuff enough. Yeah, it's not all just shooting from the prone or what people. Well, it's just like what we talk about with regular training. We can't just focus on what's comfortable and fun. We need to work on those skills that might be a little bit more uncomfortable or difficult. And that's how we progress and become better. Good stuff. Terrell. 
Yeah. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, good talk. Good to be on the show once again, after about a six year hiatus. Uh, it's good to see everybody out there. Plugs, uh, Alex from Ridgeline. Uh, and now as a former sniper instructor, I, I can look to Alex as someone I know who no bullshit, uh, knows his stuff and was able to communicate it well to various crowds based on whoever they are. So he can teach you whether you're brand new to the game or you're an old hat and Rudy's good people up there as well. Uh, so I go out at head Ridgeline and shoot some of the quantitative matches. Uh, if you want, if you want to get into that stuff, uh, you know, and don't forget to, uh, I'll be good to the people that be good to you. Yeah. Alex? Uh, well, I'm just over here all embarrassed and shit from everybody recommending me. But um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I, you know, I, I love this platform. I really do. Um, you know, as a sniper, it's like it's an assaulter gun for snipers. It's a sniper gun for assaulters. Like it is. It, it can be anything you want it to be and make it your own. Right. And go out and push it, like push your speed. Don't settle down and like, don't drop prone play sniper, like go fast, shoot from positions, like push to see what you can do with it. And, and the platform and yourself will surprise you. Um, you know, again, yeah, we, we teach a lot of this stuff. Again, it's a passion. Like most of the other guys, Ridgeline are just as passionate about this, this platform too. Cause they had similar experiences. Like a lot of us did. And we're like, Holy shit. Like we should do more of that. Um, a lot of our, our open enrollments are sold out so far for the rest of the year, but we'll, we're adding more where we can. Uh, we did just book a law enforcement class in the Chicagoland area in July. So it's a three day LE DMSPR class. Uh, it's the operator version, uh, kind of like the, the individual officer version, not the, the program development version. Um, that's gonna be held at the Aurora Sportsman Club in July. It's up on the website. Um, and then, uh, we'll do a designated marksman in, uh, Belleville, Texas here in a couple of weeks, another, uh, DMSPR hosted by TTPOA and then San Antonio PD is hosting our, uh, week long designated marksman program development course here in November. So if you guys are on the LE side and looking to get it on there and then our, our travel schedule and the rest of our schedule will drop here for, for next year shortly, you guys can start to get in on those. So, uh, whether we come to you, you guys come up to the playground, um, yeah, you know, we're here to answer questions. So ping us on whatever the IGs, the the website or whatever, and get you guys squared away. Because uh, if I can fix you before you even get here, then both of us are going to have a better time. Good deal, Mike. Uh, like Carol, it's good being back after a while, Matt. Um, go see Alex at Ridgeline. I know I need to go see Alex at Ridgeline. Um, <clears throat> As far as my company, there's a lot of good people out there that are really, really producing good shooters. Um, I My focus is going away from producing shooters because there's just spectacular dudes out there doing it. Um, my education being in education, if organizationally you need your leaders to be better at teaching, give me a call. Open enrollment stuff. If, if you want to be a better instructor, a better teacher, Give me a call. Hit me up. Email. Uh, my website is kingbreak.us. And lastly, Quantify Performance. Uh, we've got a match coming up. Actually, two matches. It's two one-day matches on 6 and 7 May at Pig River Precision in Rocky Mount, Virginia. I will be the match director for that. I'm about 90% complete with stage design right now. We've got another two one-day match weekend in August coming up at Pig River, uh, which I'll also be the match director for, and a one-day event at Sawmill Training Complex down in South Carolina. And then, of course, the series finale, which I, I want to see what kind of fun Ash and Jack have dialed up for us at the series finale at Arena in October. So come out and see us. The, the matches are on practice score. Um, I've got some fun stage fun stages planned right now it looks like we're going to reach out to about 800 so come out and see us cool chad yeah uh this has been really cool it's been fun um nice to have adult conversation <laughs> and I, i'm not saying that as an insult to anyone that would you are dealing with 
how they're twins. Yeah. Dude, I rode around like a G and I realized after like an hour that like my phone auto plays Coco Melon in the yeah. car. And I'm like, a stop lights, like, what's up, dude? I'm like, oh shit, wheels on the bus again. You know? That's anyway, right. Um, my life. How much no, Bluey but, do you watch? A bit, a bit. So it keeps it tolerable. It keeps it I really like tolerable. it. I can watch it. Yeah. They're really heavy into trains now, which all right, cool. Watch some trains. Mm. Um, but anyways. I was like, going to say, I don't even know anymore. Um, I think if people that are really interested in the whole DMR thing uh, on the consumer level, be it military person getting into it on their own or just a civilian that's concerned about things, um, fine then, you know, follow the advice given, not necessarily by me. But at the same time, consider this, it's a rifle. It's a rifle. Learn to use it as a rifle. You learn to use every inch of it. Learn how to beat somebody with it. Learn yeah, how to Jack, use it. Jaffer. To... Jaffer. So. There you go. There you go. I'm, I'm, I'm used to the little kids being around. Um, no, but like go to go to carbine classes with it. Um, and run it. Get get those reps in on those presentations. Uh, I didn't, I, don't, I think I neglected to say it. I feel terrible. Uh, the training company that I've worked with for the past several years is practical, practical farms training out of West Virginia. And um, our carbine course was great for teaching somebody up that doesn't know anything. And most instructors are like, Egh. but here's the thing. Like it's like, it, it's, it's carbine one on day one, carbine two, day two, you can come to one one time around the next time around six months later, you can jump in on two if you feel like it. Cause it's all layered, you know, but we're on the side of a mountain. Our backstop is a mountain. We have all kinds of shooting problems that we can throw at you. We will have you using all kinds of natural support, uh, whatever's around you, maximizing use of cover at all times on these scramblers, having to pick windows, lace and shots through intermediate uh, foliage and whatnot, ground clearance, mass clearance, across open air into a hillside to a partially occluded target that's under overhead canopy. So, and now you're wondering why in the world you chose a red dot, right? Um, we could give you all these shooting problems just on our primary range. And then on the advanced course, you end up over at our 3,500 acre quarry where we can have you shooting in 360 if we want to. And these scramblers where you're taking anywhere from 25 yard shots on the move, firing point to firing point to out to 400 unknown actual distance but about 400 on mgm mini poppers and so it's a real good rattle check for your kit and you to gain an appreciation of what those accoutrements you put on your gun what they actually enable to you to do better and where they fall short um, you don't have to go to pft to do that but it is a, i know firsthand having been instructed there for years and shot there as a student prior to, to that that's a great place to go, but you can get those courses. A lot of places, a lot of them out West, like, you know, play like gunsight even. And, um, Oh God, there's another couple out there, but it doesn't matter. Take this DMR out there and run it through regular carbine classes. If you want to embrace what it is to be a designated marksman, you're a rifleman son, get after it and get into a class and do it. If you want to learn the witchcraft or the voodoo about all the stuff on the inside, the magical whirly bits and how it flies, um, yeah, you can learn that too. Um, this is actually this picture behind me here. That was Mac, the old Magpul Dynamics. That was a Kalen class on SPRs. And Buddy Giraffe went down, so I gave him my SPR. I was like, I want to shoot my heavy bitch. And so I shot a heavy bolt gun through it, and I couldn't crap right for three weeks. It was so freaking exhausting. Um, get after it. Just get after it. Um, as far as plugging things, I will plug this. I put a link down in our chat, and I'm about to send it right now if I can figure out how. To a video I did a while back, and that's enough of a plug, but it's me bloviating on uh, cumulative accuracy and how it all comes together and how it can manifest downrange and on target. Uh, some of y'all probably already seen it, um, but it's me in a nutshell, just pointing at the wall, talking. So, anywho, thanks again for having me on here again. I'm, I'm glad I'm off probation, evidently. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I'm talking about for the wife. Um, but yeah, I look forward to the next stage because I'm, I'm sure I'm going to think about a lot of things I should have said and a lot of things I probably shouldn't have said. Oh, that's how it works. So.
I, I'm going to come back with a dustpan and clean up next one. So that's how it's uh, been a pleasure, John, hearing you out and hearing you, uh, Alex. And I'll obviously, Terrell, man, anytime I'm in the same room, virtual or real with Terrell, I feel like a smaller man. Oh, he's not I short. Really he's not short. No. <laughs> I love these guys. Look at Terrell. <laughs> he's like, hey, hey, man, just don't look me in the eyes. It's cool. Don't make it weird. <laughs> Ian? <clears throat> So go get your, go, go train, go play with your food, go see what it does when you do what you do to it. Uh, talking about uh, Ridgeline, talking about uh, the, the place that uh, Chad mentioned, it slipped my mind right now, but uh, there's a lot of presumed competence out there in terms of students, as well as trainers. As trainers, we need to not presume there's a level of competence out there and take it for granted, touching upon what Chad said, like the, the, the brilliance and the basics, right? So we can't presume that someone knows all these baseline things, so we do need to make sure we hit them uh, as trainers. From the student side or the one looking to sustain or advance their skill set, um, there's presumed competence in terms of what you think that trainer can do. Make sure you find a good trainer because those folks, they might, they might have a script in front of them that they've mentally memorized like a robot, but they may not know exactly the whys or answer your, your, your non-standard questions on. So if anything, take this as a road test, this, this modcast past couple hours of everything that um, Alex said of everything that Chad has said. And if you're in the military, listen to what Terrell has to say. And if you're out there and you need to know how to zero your gun, at least go buy Mike's zero tools because they're really nice. He sucks at self-promotion, so I'm doing that for him. Um, but uh, you know, if nothing else, get out there and play with your ballistic calculator, play with the variables, see what happens, if thens. Uh, you can spend time in the waiting room wherever you're at watching dumb, dumb TikTok videos, or you can lift the hood on that on that app and just have fun with it and there, there's something to be had for that or said for that but that's all i got to say uh appreciate being back on uh look forward to i guess we're about halfway done with the exactly outline so I guess exactly a hours ahead of us i hope this crew gets back together uh as well as some folks that may not have made it but um it's nice uh, to meet you john and uh, alex and see you again terrell and chad and Mike, I just don't need to see you anymore for the rest of the year. I've, I've seen you too much. That's all. Well, big thanks to the panelists. Big thanks to you, the listener. Uh, this was a cool discussion. It's enjoyable. Uh, it's especially cool that we're able to break it up the way we are going to right now and focus on the next phase of the discussion in uh, DMR4. We'll figure that out in a chat when that's going to happen. So no worries. Big thanks to the sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance. Overwatch Precision, Filster, Primary Arms, Walther. Lastly, huge thank you to the Patreon supporters. Um, those Patreon subscribers are helping pay the bills. There's a lot of things going on in primary and secondary. We have a lot of resources are, that are available for your use for free. A lot of bills that are constantly getting paid to, to, to run this whole thing. Um, if you don't want to or if you cannot uh, help support through Patreon, shares, likes, and subscriptions definitely are helpful. As I said before, make sure you're support. Make sure you're supporting those sources that you have found to be beneficial. When we're chugging along, pushing out this kind of this level of content, bear in mind it's not free, and it's it is taking up time not only to to do it but also to produce it, to edit, and all that kind of stuff. So. Likes, shares, and subscriptions are definitely appreciated. And I do have multiple other episodes that I'm working on to uh, uh, get out there. Uh, working on a couple cool ones talking about, let's see here. There's one talking about uh, some, some deadly force encounters and the aftermaths. Uh, there's another one talking about being a neutral instructor without swaying people going in either direction and possibly turning off students. Um, yeah, we have some cool stuff and we have DMR4 coming. 
but that's just scratching the surface. I have, there are so many different uh, episodes that are being worked on simultaneously. I'm telling you, this is hurting cats. So we do have a uh, website, primaryandsecondary.com, forum, primaryandsecondary.com slash forum. We have 736 different Facebook groups. We have all these resources. Use them. They're for you. Um, it's great to be able to provide that kind of stuff. It's nice to, to be helpful. So I think that's all. I am now going to go upstairs and make sure my little family is still alive and the two-year-old didn't kill everyone. Because I guess I've been getting texts that he's just running crazy. So I'll talk to you guys later.